All right, let's call the work session to order. Uh, I will go ahead and do a review of tonight's uh, council agenda, pausing for any questions for clarifying for staff uh, before we get going. Um, tonight's agenda and our consent agenda, we have our city council meeting minutes from April 1, our contract approval for the revised toll cell water agreement with the city of Portland, contract approval for the transit technology implementation project, as well as, uh, and that's the consent agenda. Um, under resolutions, we have the, our public hearing, which is continued from a previous meeting on resolution 2024-08, which is the adoption of our advanced financing reimbursement district for the 362nd through Bell Street extension. We'll then round off our evening with the report from our city manager, as well as our committee and council reports. Uh, but before we get going with our work session tonight, Jeff, will you please call the roll? Yes, Councilor Mayton. Uh, present. Councilor Smallwood. Here. Councilor Sheldon. Here. Councilor Walker. Here. Councilor Exner. Here. Councilor Hokinson. Here. Mayor Pulliam. Here. Well, welcome to our work session. We've got Rochelle and crew here to talk about our Deer Point Park um, preferred concept review. Welcome. Tyler, you want to get us going? Yeah, I'll give a brief intro, then sure. I'll take it over to Rochelle. And um, So, Council, you know, you're aware that during the budget process, we uh, had a goal of constructing Deer Point Park. It's been a long time in the making. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, that's off of the end of DeBarco, what's up to Highway 26 um, in that, in that uh, Deer Point neighborhood, hence the name. Um, and so we have some funding set aside in the budget. Uh, Rochelle and her team have been hard at work in doing a conceptual plan for what you can actually fit on that site. And so tonight um, they have a sort of, I hate to say final, but a... Um, not one of three drawings like you saw last time, but a, a more revised, um, honed in, preferred concept plan. And so with that, Rochelle, I'll let you add anything else and then we'll kick it over to Lango Hansen. Okay, well, just um, real quick, just to emphasize what um, Tyler had uh, talked about. Tonight we'll be presenting um, the preferred concepts and it's input where the council would be able to take a look at those. We did come up with those three preferred concepts based on community input, the Parks and Trails Advisory Board, we sent out surveys to the neighborhood, about 200 surveys actually received 54 comments back. We had an open house in the meantime, um, we had 15 to 20 people attend that, so um, we felt that was a really a good turnout. So, um, so far we're really pleased with the public engagement around this neighborhood park and a lot of excitement too, I think they've been waiting for this park for a while. So. Um, yeah, um, I guess without further ado, I'll hand it over to Lango Hansen, but this is a really great opportunity to take a look at um, how it's evolved to today. And then the next step will be an open house April 18th. And then we'll also uh, get feedback from the public at the April 18th open house. Question on your survey, you sent out 200? Yep. To, to the, the neighborhood? Yep. How? Via Yep. Post so, office or? Yep. We actually pulled the addresses off of the title company and then sent them out to the, the yeah, neighbors. 25% response. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Lots of excitement. Well above average. The self addressed mm -hmm. stamped envelopes. With, yes, we yeah. did encourage self addressed envelopes to return them. So, yep. still, that's, yeah. that's a really you. good yeah. term for uh, it's amazing for cold the contact simpleness of it and the actual success compared mm -hmm. to some of our other endeavors that we've done well, in the past. <laughs> yes. And sounds like it really works. I don't mean to get a sidetrack, but I will forget it if I don't mention it otherwise. We should consider geofencing some of these areas to get out the word, right? Like, I don't know if anyone understands what geofencing is, but we can target a certain geographic area with a message so that when they're on social and stuff, it pops up. So we can pick the literal geographic boundary of the area we want to push that message to. So. Anyways, just something to consider. But sorry, Rochelle. No, I told you okay. it'd be off track. That's great. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll hand it yeah, to sorry, Brian and Kurt. Yeah. We ready for the slides now? Yeah, yeah thank All you. Right. Well, we're excited to be here. I think it was March 4th we were here. Oh, well, actually virtual because of a snow day, but good to be back in person and see everybody's face. Walk through. The refined site plan, we got some good feedback from this group a month ago. And then, um, as Rochelle mentioned, just getting a lot of feedback from the both the public open house and that survey. And then also we met with the parks board middle of last month as well and um, got further input from them. So tonight, just a couple of things we want to touch on. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, looking at showing you that refined site plan and how we got there and getting some 
input on some of the specifics of the, the play area and some site furniture. And then also looking, we'll touch on at the end, just the overall project schedule for the design and the construction of that. So real briefly, just touching on those three options that we looked at last month, uh, just trying to look at three varied options to present to both council and the public to start the imagination of what that neighborhood park could be. And honestly, not to spend too much time on this, but typically when we present multiple ideas, it's always this um, blending that comes good ideas from each one that, that rise to the surface and then we bring it into that refined plan. But it's really striking with presenting to council and also at the public open house and then very much mirrored in the feedback that we got through the, the mailing, the, the survey, the, the mail-in survey. Option number two in the middle really rose to the top and both uh, in general the plan, but then we asked specific questions in that survey about the walking paths, the location of the play area, the location of the sport court, and that in, in all categories was really the preferred option. So I think what you'll see tonight um, on the next slide is it's a refinement of that, but it really sticks closely to the spirit of option two. And there's a few comments that we want to touch on tonight, things that we heard from council, and that also came up in the public uh, open house, mostly around the, the sport court that to speak to tonight. Um, I think overall the input that we got from this group, as well as the neighbors was basketball was the preferred sport. I will say that there were there was some support for pickleball, but it, it appeared, and Rochelle, you can back me up or not, but it seemed like it wasn't the neighborhood that was specific, the neighbors that were specifically supporting that, but the neighbors themselves were more in support of basketball. There were comments about um, looking at a full court. What's shown here is just a, a, half, a literal half court for basketball. There is... Technically speaking, um, in plan view, you could fit full court on there, but as you see these, the kind of the squiggly lines, those are the contour lines. So those are one foot intervals, so contour intervals. And if you rotated that and did a, a full court lengthwise, kind of parallel with Highway 26, it would fit, but it really starts to increase the amount of site grading and the, the costs associated with the retaining walls <laughs> to fit that into this site. Um, so it's, it's so on the one hand doable, but as we start to look at the overall budget for the park and how that fits in with providing the rest of the pathway amenities and the shelter and the play area, it just becomes a very um, cost heavy component to develop. Just as we look ahead, can you spell out what that means for us at some point? This yeah, thing which is dollar value. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. what is that? Yeah, definitely. Because we all have different thresholds for that. Mm -hmm. So. And I think to, to piggyback onto that, another comment that came up in both contexts was um, covering the, the basketball court, which similarly, we did do quite a bit of research into that. And the numbers were coming in pretty high, anywhere from 500 to 750,000. So here's my pushback, and it's not at you. It's over here to these guys. You know where I'm going. If it's Sandy architectural style, our kids deserve basketball courts over pretty covers in our in our park areas. Like we've got to be able to figure this out. So like, what are we quoting? Are we quoting like Sandy style, beautiful coverings that then just continue with our kids playing in the rain? Like, is that what we're doing? My understanding of the quote, and please jump in if I misunderstood this, is it's um, it's not Sandy style specifically. There are Sandy style elements, right? There's a, a pitch through. Um, I saw some some uh brief photos or, or quick photos earlier today of that so there's sandy style elements but it is not sandy style compliant and it was still coming in at that 500 to 700 and some thousand dollar price range yeah if, if i could just add on to that we um we engaged a, a couple different suppliers and this was just really saying help us out with a kind of a general quote given the the size of this and and most of what we were getting back were steel steel frame um you know corrugated roof uh structures okay. and and that's those were the the half a million mark and and we understood if we had to go into the sandy style it would you know go up exponentially from from that but Kurt, that, was that for a half court cover or a whole court cover? it was a half court it was basically what that measures out right now is about 75 feet by 75 feet and so we just drew a box around that and said help us out with what you think a, a cost would be um uh to supply that 
Um, I I do have to say too, and and we haven't gotten into too, too far. That didn't even include the labor. You know, those typically are a kit of parts, so that would be added uh, to that. Is the majority of that cost, <clears throat> excuse me, is the majority of that cost in the the grading and the and that part, or is it an actual construction and material? Well, that the the number that we've been uh, mentioning relates just simply to the covering it, it itself. That doesn't include the the surfacing for the uh, half court basketball court or fencing. We'll probably need some fencing um, uh, around it um, as as well. Five hundred to seven hundred thousand for the that, cover that, alone. That's that's the quote that we got, and and I and I, you know the. It's really because we were built, and I just want to sure. push back a little bit. Oh, yeah, totally. Like we were building these covered structures, which I realize are smaller, but on a much smaller cost per square foot than mm -hmm. that. That's One thing that came up was to just literally. Huh? It's not more close to 100,000. Yeah, so you can and build seven of them. Right. But well, that's 75 by 75. If you put a post in the small. middle, that, that yeah. was it. They were saying, you know, if it wasn't a basketball court, if it was a really big picnic shelter and we could have columns in the yeah. middle, then you're not spanning. You that was span. one of the big costs. Cost. So. I love Google because Google says between 80000 and 600000 with the average project costing 200000 yeah, That's I mean, full I, court coverage for a corrugated roof just on, what is it, when I type, what does it cost? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. No, I, I think those are those are good points. And, and we did our own Google search as well and we thought well let's just contact someone and and certainly i think if we move forward with this we spread that net much much wider um this is broadly though an issue that I, i'm just interested in more work on whether it's basketball courts or whatever is i mean are there things that we're not that's not moving ahead online because of our style at these parks and and these parts, we want to look beautiful. So like Kathleen, I'd want to hear your input on this totally, mm -hmm. right? But I just want to make sure that we're not like pricing ourselves out of opportunities for our youth and that it's what our council truly is wanting to get out of the Sandy style. And maybe I'm, I'm not speaking for everyone and we want our Sandy style elements to very much be carried into our parks. But at a minimum, I feel like we need to have a conversation as a council about about that i do i think it's off topic because i think that yes got, it is because yeah. we've got a, a quote that's too high that isn't sandy styles so i mean well sure yeah. sure I, yeah yeah we do have okay. a quote yeah i don't know how I, I, i'm not buying the quote but yeah i agree I well and i'm also concerned that even looking at extra costs you know in terms of x aren't we better off having a full court than a covered half court you know so I think those are more. Well, yeah. Well, part of to... getting back to exactly on topic, do we want another uncovered court? And we do have uncovered courts in the city of Sandy. Well, you know, we're not accomplishing the covered court that we were trying to get. I think it goes back to what the neighborhood wants. That true. You yeah. know, and yeah. so, you know, I I think I mean for me personally, if I had my brothers and my kid could get out and play basketball on a court that's not covered, I'd rather be able to get out and play basketball on a court that's not covered than not have a court at all. Right. So. Well, I just point out these, these kids on that. So the on this view, the last three houses going up the street there, there's a basketball who set out on the street there and been there for like five yeah. years. Mm -hmm. right? well, they sure. play out there every every yep. day. So mm -hmm. that's just so it, it'll in be range. used. Yeah. But, but there's lots of opportunities to play in the rain. There's zero opportunities to play pickleball in the rain. Like that's my point is there's other opportunities to play one sport in the rain. You're trying to find a way not in the rain for them to play. I don't disagree. And so we may want to go to an alternative. Yeah. I know, but we've mentioned a couple of times that other kids play in the rain a lot. So I want to make sure my point's getting across. I'd be so. curious. So we have a full court at Tupper. And what about at uh, Timberline? We have, a, we have a full court. Yes. Full court at, at there. Mm -hmm. and, and then at uh, Hamilton, we have a half court. Is that right? You know, Far Low Ridge. Barlow Ridge, I mean, is that half court or full court? I think it's half court. I think it would be yes. a half court as well. It's got boots on both ends, but it's not full size. Anyway, I, I am curious about like what did the neighbors say is half versus full court? Did, did, was there a preference or? Are you sorry? You're asking us. Yeah, like what there was, was you... a there was definitely support for basketball, uh -huh. and there were some folks that that said, "How about would you consider full court?" So it was, it was a mix, I would say. Okay, 
It wasn't all voices said we want full court, but it did come up. I'm, I'd be curious what the neighbor said. And I mean, you know, you know me, full Rochelle, court. go big or go home. Yeah. And it's <laughs> one of the things we'll look at too. And that was a request by council is yeah. what would the additional cost be for retaining wall? Because if we did full court, yeah. um, we'd have to change some and, and work around some of the challenges with the topography there. So yeah. we can, we can. I, I'd be just, do you have any idea what about? magnitude of costs it would be to go full court versus or can you angle it like I, this so that you know you don't we, have we can money? definitely look into that i can't give you a number off the top of my head okay. but it would be you know several feet of retaining walls on each end but uh -huh. i think that um we have our open house this thursday and it's a good opportunity for us to be able to you know, engage those folks that are there and specifically ask not that just to present that idea of how valuable is it to you like would you be okay with a half core? What would the advantage of full court mean to you? And just to get that additional feedback. Yeah, it just allows more you, you know, more kids, but also just looking at your drawing up there, you know, you know, instead of making it perpendicular to the highway and stuff, you know, angling it more so that it is kind of more with the uh contour mm -hmm. lines mm -hmm. again, less hopefully less uh yeah excavation and all it wouldn't have to be all lined up and everything. But if you could get it to work more with the topography, um, rather than you know, being kind of angled. Yeah, Definitely I, worth studying. I, I was wondering, you know, I'd, I'd rather have a full court covered. If I don't have a full court covered in the in the budget, then full court and then half court and cover it if it could, if not something anyway. But I wonder if, uh, I know there's some pretty flat ground in there. Is there an alternative place to put this puppy instead of having it? In, and I know there's some reasons for putting it where it's at now, but uh, there's some fairly flat ground in the existing part of the park could you have put it there and not do all the yep I, that's the yeah, place i'm thinking right through the center yeah. green area you were talking about four. number four yeah that's what yeah. i was going to say too those contour lines are pretty wide and when yeah. we have a significant cost saving in excavation and retaining wall okay. construction on the street thing. right yeah well, correct me yeah, if I'm I, wrong, but I think there's some utilities that run underneath that area that um i don't know if that's a challenge to put a go uh, basketball quarter for it but there's yeah what what i would say if you came back to us and said we, we'd really like a, a full court what i think we would probably do is first of all take a look at rotating that court mm -hmm. um and we might push that arced path a little bit closer to the street because i i think that if we think about all the locations and the previous options we looked at a number of them the the advantage of that is being um, so close to kind of the highway and how how noisy it oh, is. Sure. It's That's far nice away spot. from from um, all all the homes. And so I think we'd really try our best to have it work in that that location yeah. um, and and um, slightly adjust some of the other elements. And to piggyback on that, I will say one thing in talking to several of the neighbors at the last open house was just a concern of having amenities right next to their house in terms of noise or activity. They wanted a little bit of buffer as much as we could provide. That was really important. So, sure, but to, to the mayor's point, I, I would love to have a covered full court. You could put it on a piece of flat ground and make it 300,000 instead of a half a million just for the covering. Maybe we could put up with a little bit of noise someplace or maybe we could do some screening and all sorts of things that we've done in the past. I, I think, I, from my viewpoint, I would love to see maybe a little bit of check, see if there isn't some other way. Okay. Oh, well, quick question. Um, where's the money coming from? Great question. Mm -hmm. So we have 1.5 million in the current biennium budget for this project. Mm -hmm. um, the project is also, I haven't got to this slide yet, so I don't wanna jump too far ahead, but in a couple slides, you'll see an overall schedule and you're gonna see that it crosses over into the next biennium as well. So if there were other add-ons, modifications, coverings, depending on what the development um, community looks like at that point in time and what we're projecting for SDC, there's probably room for additional um, uh, allocation of funds to other components of the project. That's if the project stays we haven't had a project yet that's stayed. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I think the thing that I've had a hard time with, and we haven't talked about this, Rochelle, but <clears throat> my experience with park construction is vastly different than what this park construction looks like. The, the park construction projects that now I'm familiar with are skate park, pump track, demo. Sure. Um, yeah. you know, it's a kind of a whole different sure. <laughs> apples and oranges right. to Councilor yeah. Walker's yeah. points. Um, and so... I think this 
I'll need to take some time to really better understand the scope of work and a smaller scale project and really understanding like what, where do you see cost overruns? What are the ramifications of that on a smaller scale? Uh, but obviously we have some experts that have built many parks that could probably speak much more eloquently <laughs> to that question. So I'll turn it over to you to add anything else you'd like to add. Well, the one thing to consider that's unique about this project is the partnering with the adjacent developer. And um, as part of that initial agreement, um, they will be at some point doing grading uh, pathways. And so we know that the timing of this park is also somewhat tied to, mm -hmm. to their development or figuring out a path forward where we're leveraging what they are supposed to do with an earlier construction. So I think that will also help out to a certain degree with the funding. So that that's kind of a news to me. So, cause I, I, I didn't expect the development to the east to go forward very soon. I can I can speak to that. Yeah. So I've been in communications with them over the last six to eight months, just you know, trying to time this and figure out when they're hoping to start. It is up in the air. However, um, part of one of the things that we've talked about, and it's in the final order, is that there are some requirements that they need to do. And so um, when we discuss the schedule, which will be at the end of the slide, you'll see how we're sort of trying to align that work. And if we do get to the finish line first, um, one of the things that we have been talking about is potentially going back and forth as far as maybe they come in and they do the grading first, or we negotiate some sort of development agreement and that was part of the impetus too of why we wanted to sort of start this process now. So when we do work with them, we have an idea of where we want to put paths, how we want to work with the adjacent um, bull run. So um, we're we're sort of getting ahead of the game here, so we have an idea of what we want to see with them when the time comes to partner. Good job. Next one. Yeah. So I think we're. Definitely getting some good feedback on the basketball board and developing some options for that and coming back with costs and implications of full court covered. And the next thing we want to touch on was the play area itself and what the character of that could start to look like. Um, we on this slide have just included a number of different images of, of styles and types of play equipment and uh, anything from nature play to the bottom inclusive play or something that's, you know, a, a signature element, a large climbing, freestanding climbing structure in the bottom middle, or a combination of both nature play and modern um, on the upper right. And then obviously the the other, like, well, what are what are we missing or what what would you like to see? What we're gonna cover it, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do oh, skip that right in there. Okay. So we we got some good feedback from the parks board in terms of um just considering the the other types of play equipment in nearby parks and diversifying. So people that this either living in this neighborhood or nearby have a variety of experiences. Other other input that we received for them was definitely highlight the inclusive play. Um making sure that it is universal and accessible to all. What is the closest part to this part that doesn't, where they don't have to cross the highway? That is a good timber line. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not, that's not really a walkable or to me close proximity. So this is really all by itself on the end of town. So less worried about if it duplicates a feature or not. Yeah. And those amenities at that park specifically are, at least from my experience, geared towards much younger kids. Uh, um, yeah. That's like, my three-year-old really and enjoys that type. Yeah, Timberline is really young with the basketball. Ones. Yeah, it's one yeah. Of the so some of these other amenities for a a little bit of an older kid would be a nice okay. add from my perspective. Can I ask? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kathleen. No, go ahead. I I'm just not um, up to date on like what current. Can you explain to me exactly what inclusive play means? How long of a presentation do you want? <laughs> yeah. Just like, um, like, it, like it, what does that it's, encompass? It goes, the short answer is, I think people think of people with uh, mobility uh, impairments, but it goes way beyond that to involving people of all abilities, cognitive abilities, physical abilities, any any type of impairment, just making sure that we're making play experiences for, for everybody. So it, um, that's that's a very broad answer, I think, but it is being specific in the types of play equipment that we pick that provide a, a whole range of skill experiences and skill opportunities and not just one thing that's usable in, in one specific way. 
like like sensory um like um kids that are in the autism range um tend to like more enclosed spaces so we'll make sure if we have a big climbing rock um it'll have like a little nook or something that's a little bit more enclosed so it provides uh challenges for kids of all mobilities but also other other um other issues as well thank you I just, yeah. you know. And we're doing totally quite a bit of inclusive play structures at the community okay. campus Cedar Park, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. we are. Yeah. And it extends to as well as like accessing the play features mm -hmm. and the amenities and mobility is definitely a part of it. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, my favorite thing I'll just say right now is the free standing climbing structure because I think those things are so popular and the taller the better. And kids love them. They're Every park I've been to that has them, they're crawling all over it, climbing it. I also like the modern play features just because I think they're longer term, um, you know, longer lifespan. You know, we've got Fantasy Forest and all, but, you know, given that you got a lot of wood and everything, that's a little bit harder. You know, it's appropriate in some places, but I, I am a little bit concerned that, you know, I don't know, Tiana could probably speak up here, but, you know, just the maintenance and the usability in the rain and things like that it's it tends to stay you know wetter longer and and all but um and and you can still include um you know some of those um what are the platforms things you know the what was called the the nest yeah nest kind of the swings. nest swings yeah. and stuff with your swing set set and you yeah. know, kind of create that you know so that they're in the middle with all the other uh swings and I'm not so much, you know, personally a fan of the nature play just because I think, you know, we have the woods, you know, <laughs> we have nature play all around us and in, in many, you know, in the open but, spaces and in, in, in the woods said, there by the park. That park is as far away from the trails and everything else as anything. Right. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I, I think it's. But didn't you say, I, I'm not sure that it's a, up to a vote at the moment, but didn't you say that the preference was for inclusive play from the responses from the public, right? Is that right? Yeah, and I guess it's worth noting that with inclusive play, it's almost like an overlay that you can apply to right. any other Certainly. type of play, like whether it's nature play or not, or modern play, any of those can be, uh, inclusive principles can be incorporated into that type of play. So when I start seeing like the climbing structure and I'm literally, I'm just looking at one picture here, I see liability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some kid hanging himself up 30 feet up or so. It's just... I only see liability as they walk to it. Not like Is that right? Okay. Well, it's, 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 Actually, there, I mean, can you speak to that? That's, you know, a good point to make, but, you know, I've done a little okay. research on that, but let's kind of hear your thoughts on that. Um, well, um, I, I think in terms of, of liability, um, the play manufacturer has done the netting in such a way that um, it doesn't have um, small openings that are four inches or, or less, and those tend to be kind of red red flags. Um, I think that um, we also the the safety surface that we use is is absorbent, mm -hmm. and um, you know, as a I think a lot of us here. Growing up with uh, instead of having bark, we had asphalt as a safety <laughs> surface. So I think kind of balancing of having some things that kind of encourage um, a, a little bit of danger is always kind of healthy. Um, but I I think we're we all understand that we don't want to do anything that is uh, that is a liability. They put these in quite a bunch yeah. of different yeah. places, and yeah, like you said, the surfacing yeah. underneath is key. And you know, <clears throat> and and my concern is again, that we have all these tot lots mm -hmm. and having these structures, you know, a variety of structures, but stuff that will excite and challenge yeah. older kids a little bit yeah. is something that we don't have in most of our parks and that we need. Yeah. So that's, that's important. And just to add to the safety aspect too. So Tiana is SIPSI certified, which is certified playground safety inspector. So we do regular inspections, make sure the fall materials at where it needs to be. And then, um, Fortunately, we have a fixed to recreation immunity this year too. So um, those cover us from any of that liability. So hooray for that. So good plug. <laughs> Next year's <laughs> right. Well, that was my joke with the walking too. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I didn't, I didn't get it oh, yeah, you didn't get to see that. You got Don't it. explain it. Don't explain it. Right. When is your uh, meeting? Is it the 18th? Yes, the public open house. Yeah. 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 yeah.
Well, let's yeah. All right. Yeah. So we don't have to spend too much time on this, but we want to touch briefly on some of the site for potential site furnishings throughout the park benches, maybe bike racks, definitely picnic tables, trash receptacles. And these specifically, these images here were this um it's a kit of furniture that we developed for Cedar Park, working with Rochelle and her group there to see what's gonna hold the test of time, uh, stand up against the, the elements and folks visiting the park and using it. Uh, so yeah, just starting to look at some of those study that we did there and replicating that for Deer Point as well. Is that real wood on the table? In that picture it is, yes. Which in other districts we found is um, more easy to maintain. Is you go down to the hardware store and get another plank and put it right back on versus, I mean, recycled, you could do the same, but you might have to order it from a special supplier. And then, so to the schedule here, um, we are currently in the bar, the yellow bar in the top left. This is the programming and design phase where going from our three options down to one refined site plan right here in the middle of April, tying up the, putting a bow on this with our uh, open public open house later this week. Um, and then really transitioning, taking that input that we've received, taking that refined site plan and moving into the construction document phase there, kind of that dark orangish color. And there's still in that phase, still time to establish the um, things such as the basketball court, half court, full court, covered, not covered, um, still making decisions like that in that process. So that really goes through uh, middle of September, tailing into uh, permitting and bidding. And then just a slight break early in 2025, mostly due to weather, and then just hitting the ground running in spring once the weather's really good, construction, wrapping up um, mid-fall for the grand opening of the park. Cool. More questions? I think it'll be really exciting. Be a great park when it's all completed. Mm -hmm. so. Finally. Yeah, I've asked you for a long time. I just have a comment about that timeline. And I was just wondering if there's any way to move the opening a few months earlier, because it seems kind of almost innocuous to open it up in October <laughs> <laughs> when it starts to get cold and it won't be able to be used at least progressively very long. Um, so I didn't know if there was any opportunity to move it a few months um, earlier. That's just something to think about. Yeah. yeah. And then the other is I would love to see more research done into the coverage because just in the short time you were talking and I do construction in my main job mm -hmm. and I'm not advocating to bid for this at all because we don't do that. But I, I found everything that said I could build a, a, a full court cover for anywhere between 160 and 250. And then if I wanted to make it Sandy style, I can imagine that's another 150 or 200. That's still under 500. Mm -hmm. And what you pr presented just seemed awfully high. I know that was just one person. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to find national suppliers of basketball court covers that can be modified to fit the Sandy style that would be inclusively you know, less expensive. Yeah. So just a just a thought for, sure. for future yeah. funds. And then you could play basketball in November under a cover. That also is on that yeah. cover you structure. I don't like the idea of a metal pole building, a pole barn that's turned into a basketball. It's, mm -hmm. it's the least attractive option to me. But um, I wonder if, um, what, what do they call it? The uh, tensile structures um, with a, um, you know, those, those material stretched between mm -hmm. wires and poles might be a, a cost effective option. I mean, we're not we're not looking for weatherproof warm. We're just looking for right. rain protection. Yeah, right. And, and they, they do offer mm -hmm. some designs there that could provide uh, snow and ice loads that we want and winds that we get. So, they had um, good examples of those when we visited Bend Parks and Rec. They yeah. had, um, yeah, the fabric. Um, but I don't I don't know how what kind of slope you need and mm -hmm. what happens. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's a thousand sure. different variants. Yeah. Yeah, they're sure. they're yeah. this way or spread out in triangles yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it might be a different way to look at the the problem space yeah. and make it cheaper. Yeah, yeah. I think our our takeaway is definitely we'll be looking at the, the full court, how it might be positioned, and then certainly a lot more research into um, different types of covering. And I think that. Um, I'm not that, cons I don't want a metal pole barn, but I think there's way, you know, I've seen some, you know, different things like the 
school district and all that, you know, they've kind of put up some stuff and there is ways to, you know, kind of for the pillars to, you know, wrap them in stone and, you know, wood um, and things like that to kind of lend them a little bit more of a Sandy style look. They don't have the same roof pitch. Mm -hmm. um, they have a shallower roof pitch, but there's, you know, I think still ways to kind of lend itself to Sandy style without meeting every part of the code. If, you know, if it's necessary for such a large structure yeah. and, just, at what point does the code apply? It's not, yeah. Well, what, what I'm saying apply? is that different entities have come to us and asked for exceptions to Sandy style. And Mark, what's very, his name with the move? The thing got like 11 exceptions and then came in for 11 more and we said no on yeah, most of them. So yeah. I'm right. just saying that we can apply for an accept a variance too if we want to, you know, because the type of use that we're, you know, we're not building a Dutch bros or something like that. So, you know, it may be prudent, especially and, if it saves us, you know, $300,000, so. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think what we've heard loud and clear is that if we can find a way to make a cover right. that is attractive right. and is not an eyesore for passerby right. from the highway or the community, um, that that's the avenue that the council would like to go in. So we'll bring forward some sort of creative plan to make sure we can- I mean, To me, that's a prominent showpiece off 26. Yeah. That's what people it's are gonna see. Yeah, that's what nice. That's, that's, been, that's been in my head too. Yeah. Um, and so we just- Yeah. But I mean, it, I, maybe it's the, because I said it quietly over here, but just so I say it, so everybody hears it, is we hold other people to the Sandy style. We should not be making rules as an exception to ourselves. All right. All right. And I agree hundred percent, but there's also a difference between pot irks and commercial mm -hmm. development. Sure. But, we right. could, but I hear what you're saying. I am with you. We put a pole barn, yeah. won't it match that DOT one that's right <laughs> next door? <laughs> <laughs> you mean ODA? ODA, the ODA one. I know what you meant. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Really appreciate the Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, we will take a break and be back at. Let's really start at seven though, because we get so much time here. Everybody, please join me for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, for normal, I'll go ahead and start with the review of tonight's agenda. Um, we will uh, uh, call the roll and we'll get into any proposed changes to tonight's agenda. Then get into public comment. I do have one submitted here. Uh, Jeff, have we had any others online or in person submitted? That's the only one I have here. Well, I, I, oh, give me a second here. Uh, my, I, I see other people here. A reminder, similar to the last time we had a meeting, um, uh, we will be having a public hearing, and that will be the uh, opportunity for you to testify at that time. Uh, the public comment or for be all other items people might want to testify on, but it looks like I just have one submitted for that. Uh, we'll then get into the consent agenda, which has our city council meeting minutes from April 1st, mm -hmm. our contract approval for the revised wholesale water agreement mm -hmm. with the city of Portland, as well as the contract approval for the transit uh, technology implementation project. We'll then get into resolutions, which is that public hearing on the resolution 2024-08 for the adoption of the advanced financing reimbursement district for the 362nd to Bell Street extension. After that, we'll wrap up the evening with a report from our city manager and our committee and council reports. With that, Jeff, will you please call the roll for tonight? Yes, Councillor Maiden. Present. Councillor Smallwood. Here. Councillor Sheldon. Here. Councillor Walker. Here. Councillor Axner. Here. Councillor Hokinson. Here. Mayor Pulliam. Present. Thank you, Jeff. With that, is there any proposed changes for tonight's agenda? I don't have a change. I do just have one question on the water rates for the uh... We'll run a great agreement. Oh, for when we get to the consent agenda? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, with that, um, we'll go ahead and get into public comment. Again, for those of you here for the public hearing, wait for that moment. Uh, but I will call um, for a Holly Mains um, uh, to please come to the podium. Um, you, Holly, you will be provided uh, three minutes for public testimony. Please state your name and address for the record, and welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. Hi, my name is Holly Manus. My full address is uh, 30160 Southeast Haley Road, Corian, Oregon, 97009. Um, I'm here as a community member, and I'm here today to oppose donkey basketball. 
Donkey basketball is being held this Wednesday, April 17th at the Sandy High School. BFFA or Feature Farmers of America is putting on the fundraising event. I emailed the contact person on the poster. I'm going to read my email that I sent to Reagan on Friday, April 12th. She has not responded. Hi, my name is Holly Manus. I have two miniature donkeys and I have provided um, pictures if anyone wants to see um, my exhibits. Um, my two miniature donkeys, Dilly and Dolly, we live in Boring, Oregon. They are rescue donkeys and we are their fourth home. I love them and they are very special to me. So when my son and I were walking into the Sandy Clackamas County Bank yesterday to do some banking, I saw your donkey basketball poster. I immediately knew that I needed to oppose this upcoming event of donkey basketball. Let me make this clear that I support the FFA in fundraising for this association. The silent and live auction being held on April 17th at the Sandy High School sounds appropriate, but riding donkeys on a polished basketball court is abuse. They will be so scared. This makes me so sad to think of them being treated like this. The coin hooves are not meant to be walking and running around on polished, slippery basketball courts. At least the rodeo equines, bulls, and cattle are able to walk, trot, run, and buck on layers of sand and dirt in an, in an arena. It is not safe for miniature donkeys and standard donkeys to be holding a person of more than 100 pounds on their back. This is just a really old timey and barbaric sport that is accepted throughout our beautiful United States of America. I support the FFA, but I beg you, please do not have donkeys participate in donkey basketball. If you must, can you please have an equine bet there at the event in case a donkey gets hurt by falling and being pulled? Their hooves are so special and a good farrier may need to be present as well. I have contacted Susie at Zeb's Wish in Sandy, Oregon, and the Oregon Donkey Sanctuary in Oregon City, Oregon. I have provided exhibits also. I have a letter from John and, I mean, I'm sorry, Rhonda and Jim Uriquat from the Oregon City Donkey Sanctuary. They were able to shut down a donkey basketball event at one of their local high schools back in um, 2014. This is their letter. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Peaceful Valley Donkey Rescue. The pictures of what happens at donkey basketball. These are my adorable donkeys, mm -hmm. Billy and Dally. Mm -hmm. I am walking them in um, a cul-de-sac by my neighbor, well, by my street. Um, here's them again in their area. They love to be together. And if this doesn't sell you, this is Dilly laying her head on her mom's back. Oh. <laughs> this is as much weight as they should have on their back. Thank you for your time. And I will also go to the Oregon Trail School District to give them my opinions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, and um, and of course, we're all leaders here in this community, so it makes sense for you to testify to us as your Sandy City Council, okay. but it is a good reminder the Oregon Trail School District is the one that kind of oversees that property and what happens there, so it would be a great place to go and testify to those folks. Thank, Thank you. you for your time this evening. Appreciate Thank it. Um, with that, um, we will move ahead to our consent agenda. That has our city council meeting minutes from April 1, 2024, mm -hmm. the contract approval for the revised wholesale water agreement with the city of Portland, and the contract approval for the transit technology implementation project. That sounds like Councilor Walker has a question. I just had one question on the um, water rates for um, being charged. They seem, you know, and I read the paper the other day with the huge cost increase that Portland has for their system. So I, I, you know, maybe that's the answer, but in 2028, 29, um, it goes from $2, you know, 2.546 per hundred thousand gallons or something to the next year, it goes to 429, which is almost doubling. I'm just curious, is there any Claire, but you know, just kind of why it would almost go up so high in just one year. Um, well, if I'm if I'm in the staff report, if I may clarify, um, it is two point five four in fiscal year twenty eight twenty nine, 
And then in fiscal year 33, 34, it goes to 4.7. Right, but at your, on your uh, full run, what, what is it? The, um, the rate sheet that you gave, that you mm -hmm. handed out? So yeah. what this new wholesale agreement does is mm -hmm. it follows the AWWA's ability to capitalize on projects. So they're starting on building the treatment facility, which when we get there and connect to, we will owe mm -hmm. our portion of that plant. So what you see the rapid rising is they start capitalizing the money spent every year to build the, the billion dollar plant. So that's yeah. that's the rise you see and then it, then it holds. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes up and then it goes like between 28 and 20, 29 and 30, it goes like up almost double and then kind of continues to rise. And I was just mm -hmm. wondering, you know, it seemed like a gradual rise would be more it's it's when the construction dollars finish and then that gets passed out among so it's the, the initial sales. step function and then it, yeah. then it's more trended. It is all right. That's that was my question. That's the answer. Yes. Yeah. All right. Unless there's further discussion, I'll entertain a motion to adopt. Make a motion to adopt the consent agenda. For a second. I'll second it. Motion by Councillor Humpenstein, a second by Councillor Mayton to adopt the consent agenda. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. Can I make a statement? Please. Thank you for the negotiation. It's been a lot of the work, and it seems kind of almost, almost like soft pedaling it when we put it in the consent agenda. And talk about you know the months and uh, to you and uh, our consultant and getting that negotiated. It's a very, very good deal for Sandy. And if anybody wants to look at the uh, included presentation that compares the benefits, that's a really good single slide to talk about why this is a good deal for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right. Moving ahead to resolutions. Uh, City Council will now resume public hearing on resolution 2024-08, which has been continued from our March uh, 18th, 2024 council meeting. I will now call for any new abstentions from the hearing body. I will call for any new conflicts of interest from that hearing body. All right, staff. Um, um, oh, I'm supposed to ask you, is there new written testimony? I guess there's been new written testimony submitted since March 18th into the public hearing? Yes, or has there been? There were two uh, yeah. exhibits, so they're both That's in the packet there. Right. That's correct. Thank you. All right, with that, let's get the staff report. Jenny, thank you. Thank you. Um, on February 5th, and again on March 4th, City Council considered formation of an advanced finance reimbursement district to cover recover a portion of funds invested to build 362nd and Bell. After careful consideration, Council directed staff to bring a resolution to Council with the following elements. Evaluation of $2,480,935 which is 20% of the street funded portion of the project. The city is not asking for reimbursement from the sewer or water funded portions. A reimbursement methodology using developable area, an interest rate of 5% and a reimbursement term of 20 years. Um, as stated by the mayor on March 18th, um, the city was asked for a continuance of the meeting so the affected landowners could have time to further study um, the effects of the AFD on them. Um, in the intervening period, city staff has met with or answered questions and reached out to all affected property owners at that time. Um, we do have two clarifications to public testimony that was given March 18th. Um, the first one, there was a clarification about would this affect a property owner doing routine maintenance of their property? There was mention of a damaged barn. Our city manager stated that was certainly not in the spirit of this. And since that time, we have clarified, AJ has worked with council to clarify the resolution stating that this is really intended for redevelopment, not maintenance of your property. Number one, there was also some confusion about the interest rate accruing there is no payment due by property owners at any time every year. It's not like a tax. This only affects them if they develop or redevelop their property and it's due at such time as they come in um, to the planning department. 
So with that, um, we have had two written testimonies in the intervening period. Um, one was four. Um, one asked for consideration for this to be changed to a 10-year term or a 10% instead of a 20%. Um, and in summary, staff recommends adoption of resolution 2024-08. All right, thank you, staff. Uh, with that, we'll move ahead for the additional public testimony. Here's the guidelines for those who wish to speak. Please try to avoid repetition of someone else who's already expressed the same thoughts. It is sufficient to state that you agree with the statements of a previous speaker, even if that's all you say. If you have documents, maps, or letters that wish to have uh, that you wish to have considered by the council, they must formally be placed into the recording of this proceeding. To do that, either before or after you speak, please email your materials to recorder at ci.sandy.or.us, and staff will make sure your evidence is properly processed. To offer public testimony, for those joining us in person this evening, please raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to speak. If you're participating online, use the raised hand button and wait to be recognized. If you are participating via telephone, please dial star nine in order to raise your hand and wait to be recognized. I will now call on each person when it is your turn to speak. Each participant will receive up to five minutes to testify and our city recorder, Jeff, will let you know when you have 20 seconds remaining. Our city council rules do require that each person state their name and address for the record. I will now call for testimony on the proposed resolution. You will have five minutes each, and this would be the moment to raise your hand, either in person or electronically. Yes, Linda, please. Okay. There are only two of us? Yeah, two, two so far. Two of us. Just not raising your hand. Um, Linda Malone, 17740 Bluff Road. And I want to start by saying, um, just because I've been around for longer than dirt, uh, that um, I'm really pleased that the council was able to get this through with grants and with loans and with money from our um, street fund. This has been a long wanted north-south connection for the city. And so I'm pleased that it happened. And I'm glad that it's there as an alternative for people from the high school or from the city. And being that I live on Bluff Road, it does cut down a little bit on the traffic that goes by the front of my house. Although that's not why, because we sit far enough back that I don't even hear the traffic, especially as I'm getting older. But uh, I do think that it's only fair and uh, fair to the community and to the citizens who won't reap as big a benefit financially as the adjacent properties owners will. Um, I'm glad that we didn't have to go through de eminent domain to get the land to make the road that they, you know, were able, we were able to purchase that land from the adjacent property owner in order to complete the extension of Bell Street and 362nd to make that north-south connectivity. But I do, um, want to state that I think the 20% AFD is the minimum that should be assessed that will at some point in time bring the, the street fund back to somewhat whole status, even if it's not for 20 years. Um, the only thing I would find different uh, would be that I, I think um, the 5% interest should start accruing when the property either redevelops, if someone comes in to develop it, or if it's sold. Um, because otherwise that that starts building up and it could cause the person who owns land who doesn't want to sell, who wants to live there forever, feel forced to sell. And I don't think that that's the goal of the council or the city to force people into the position of selling to redevelop. And we also know that redevelopment's not going to happen real quick because we do still have a sewer moratorium, don't we? A building moratorium because of the uh, sewer treatment plant. So if we... Um, use this as impetus to solve that problem and maybe encourage people who want to sell their land and get it redeveloped or redevelop themselves. Um, as soon as they do that, the interest would start accruing and the city would end up be recouping what we paid for the road. Um, so that would be the only change I would make. I would hope you would approve this measure, the 20% for 20 years and a 5% starting at the time that the land is either redeveloped or sold. And that's it. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. One other thing, 
When did we get these huge monitors that make it so we can't see counselors' faces? Uh, well, since we got, I can't see over them either. Since, since we all got so unattractive. Well, I'm not in favor of the large monitors. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, um, others who wish to testify, please. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Sure. Eric Lindeen at 36405 Southeast Highway 26. And I just don't know where to start. But, uh, um, my fish, first issue was, you know, city acted as the GC on this project. And um, there's, it was, I believe, in my opinion, it was, some of it was mismanaged. I mean, I've, uh, the design drawings at the beginning. I've got Mike Walker drawings here from 2008 that showed the alignment of the streets that we created uh, 16 years ago and why we ended up with extra engineering fees. Um, and I got the feeling from inside and outside the city hall here that uh, that there should have been like a project manager on on this to to avoid a lot of these issues to move it forward more more economically. Um, the other uh, the division that you guys had to come up with some kind of methodology, and I realize that. Uh, but uh, with the different size lots and uh, different zonings and um, there's no real equal way to have done it, I believe. Uh, so somebody's going to get it, get hit hard and it's square footage at 59 cents. It's, I mean, obviously we're going to take the blunt of that. Um, <clears throat> but to alleviate alleviate some of that, I, I didn't recognize Linda at first here, but she was on this I budget committee. <laughs> and, uh, uh, these overages came up early on, and then the, the new budget was started in 22. And you guys accepted it in 23. And the, the, the budgets has this all this overage all blended in to it already uh i i know uh jenny you know tried to dummy down some of that but it still hit hits the commercial properties hard i mean we we don't have the sewers and the waters figured in but it's a big hit for us um the other thing, uh, us as landowners, we don't have the, well, we might have access to grants and loans and stuff, the same as the city, but we don't, we're, uh, at this point, we're not capable to buy for all those. The city can keep, keep adding to that budget that they lost. And uh, I was talking with Carl that they, didn't get a six million dollar grant that they applied for this legislators year, but possibly in the next session they can reapply and get some of that to to blend this all in. Uh, this property, it's it's our heritage. Uh, Gilbert bought it in eighteen ninety three from the California Railroad, and it's been passed down through the family. It's changed names. Uh, to my father was a John Drude uh, descendant. So uh, 1956, when I was an infant, we moved back to the to the homestead, and uh, I just I'm just I just feel that maybe there's another way to cure this overage. Uh, um, I'm going to have to. Uh, Basically, when I market it, I'm gonna, at some point, I'm, uh, if we do get something going, 
It's, I'm going to have to almost add a surcharge to a developer. Um, it, it, it just uh, seems like there'd be a better way to uh, alleviate this and do a better way to promote development and to have this hanging over everybody's back. Uh, I, I realize we need the street. We still need the north-south. We still need 362nd. Uh, the, the issues are still still in place that came with this intimate domain takeover. And um, we could have managed it better. I think uh, it would be a lot better off. But hopefully, we can uh, reduce some of this uh, these funds that you're trying to recoup or, or let them go away altogether and let's get it some other way with new development, our taxes, and uh, how many jobs we're going to bring. 20 seconds, Mr. Lind. Okay. Yeah, I pretty much got it covered. Uh, Jenny's done a great job. I visited with her. Uh, she's got a handle on the fixes, and I think she's got a great outlook on the future. So, uh, Maybe we can blend this all in without hitting us all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks for the clarification. Thanks. Um, was there eminent domain on this project? With the Lundin property, we did have to go to court and we did something called a quick take and then we negotiated and settled. Okay. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, yes, please. For Chris, I think that prior to me. I'm Doug Castle, uh, 16200 L Street Wind Tunnel. <laughs> what was that again? I don't know. Bell Street Wind Tunnel. The good one. <laughs> Now, the January storm did a did a number on the eastern properties mm -hmm. on the Bell Street. Uh, the Advanced Finance Public Improvement District, Reimbursement District, um, I guess there's been around a dozen of those in Sandy. Um, we couldn't think, and can, maybe you can help me here, help us here, were any of those districts um, composed of properties that were both commercial, residential, and actually uh, two different kinds of residential. Uh, commercial is the three larger properties. The residential R2 is the three smaller properties. And my property, the third one, the Eastern most has a third zone on the East side Creek it's for single, single family residential. Um, I'm thinking in my mind, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that those three zones are worth at least a little bit difference in money, or is it drastic? I'm not sure. And there's nothing in the reimbursement district that reflects that. Um, the other one is the wetland constraint. As I looked over the figures, they look pretty good, except for when I look at my property, the wetland constraint is three hundredths of an acre where the same stream runs into an adjacent property or from an adjacent property, um, it's uh, six tenths of an acre. And the stream, same stream runs diagonally through my property. Um, so my, I'm thinking it's gotta be more. In fact, in 2008, when Persimmon developers made an offer on our property, they came back later after investigating and said, we can't pay you for that stream and the setback. And in fact, when the city made the offer back in, I think 2020 or 21 for our property, the map they used showed almost two acres of setback for the stream. And as a consequence, our property was valued less per acre. And so we were offered a lot less per acre than what this setback would indicate. Does that make sense? 
um, AJ provided the map that that they used for figuring the three hundreds. And um, when it comes onto our property, the stream is a little sliver. It looks like it's probably just the water uh, without any setback. And I'm thinking in my mind that can't be right. So if that could be investigated and researched, um, if in fact it's closer to the two acres, that is going to change the total acreage of the district, not by much, but by enough to make a difference in the amount per acre, not counting the different zoning. I think it should be, the zoning should be accounted for because it's going to sell differently. Um, the third and last thing I want to say is we talk about benefits of the, um, the road. Uh, we've lost privacy. We deal with a lot of noise, especially from seniors with their uh, pickups that like to race away from the high school at 2.30. Seniors, seniors? and students. <laughs> students, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe you caught me or something. I got a little fast. But... <laughs> Correct, yes. Yeah. We've all been there, right? Um, we had um, a goat pass away after the goat ate Jimson weed, which I've never seen in Sandy. Um, and it's, it didn't just fall off the wheels of a truck. It was blown on to the, the slopes and the sides of the road and some in the middle. And those seeds can last up to 100 years and be in the ground and come up spraying. Spraying does practically nothing to them. I spent last year several days going along the road picking those seed pods before they burst open because the seeds just go like that. So if you get a chance, look up Jimson weed. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, bro. All right. Others who wish to speak, please raise your hand, either electronically by doing the electronic raise hand button, telephone, star nine, or physically here in person. Yeah. How about online? Not seeing any raised hands online. Okay. All right. With that, um, I will call for the staff recap and recommendation. Thank you. Um, we do know this is a, a sensitive issue impacting property owners. Uh, we do also recognize that the building of the road, while it did improve connectivity and emergency access, it also will raise the prices of the affected property owners. And we also do say that this road was built at, um, or the AFD is being offered at an 80% discount of the true cost. I would also note that no staff time, including mine or Ryan's or any of the legal counsel, which was required to obtain all of this right away is included in the total cost of this project, which was 12.94 million. Um, Many developers, as well as other cities, including Sandy, do do advanced finance reimbursement districts. So this reimbursement district will help rebuild uh, the street operations fund, which is needed to maintain our roads throughout the city. And staff does recommend adoption of resolution 2024. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I will call for a motion to close the public hearing. Want to close the public hearing. Is there a second? I'll second. There, there's a motion uh, by Councillor Elkinson, a second by Councillor Exert. It closed a public hearing. I'll close it at 7.31 p.m. Uh, discussion by the hearing body. Mayor, do we need to vote on that? I'm sorry. There was a... No, no, do I, oh, there's a motion. Is there a, a second? Oh, I just closed it, didn't I? All those in favor... I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> I wish. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. It's now closed at 7.32 p.m. All right. Discussion. I have a question for staff. Um, one of the things that I think it was Mr. Castle brought up was the values of his property and uh, the different zones and such. And it, <clears throat> to some degree, it does make sense to me that some of the values were would be different between a single family and a commercial and those sort of things. And especially if some of the property was unusable. Uh, did we not consider those things in terms of the percentages of 
of affected properties? Um, I thought we did. I didn't think that there, there, there. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor, are you done? Go ahead. Um, so there, there were two different pieces of testimony. Um, we did use calculations of the developable area, including setbacks for the stream and the wetlands. AJ did check that, and so we can double check again. But the GIS does show the width right. of the stream and the setback. I'm looking at maps here. It shows the setback and riparian area identified. So I want to make sure that that was done. It seemed like that would be logical. It yeah. it was done. Yes. Um, the different examples I've seen for AFRDs consider how to apportion the value of the improvement. And so that is, so you look at the improvement and you do it based on the area or the street frontage, including another layer of the zoning wasn't seen in any of the examples okay. we've seen. And so that, that wasn't considered the different zoning. So continue with Mr. Castle's uh, question about the difference of the, the wetland area he believes should have been excluded from the developable land versus staff report. Do you, can you help offer a comment as to why the staff report's right? What we are seeing, and, and I hate to be the guy that you know, is what we got on the computer here today, but the calculations for all these properties were based on the wetland area from our GIS layer. And Can you say that the, well enough? They're, based from, from they're based from the wetland area of our GIS layer, which I have in front of me. The discrepancy between the Miller property and the Castle property, it's just a much narrower strip of land over that creek there. And the reasons for that, we didn't develop these layers, so I couldn't say why they are the width they are, but that's what this is all based off of, for what was removed from each of the property areas, developable property areas. Okay. Uh, I'm ready. Well, well, no, I mean, I, well, I wanted to go a, couple, a, a, a different track. I just wanted to see if there's any more questions on, on De Castle's property before I went there. I wanted to um, weigh the five percent interest uh, that starts. I have a thought on that. I'm yeah, yeah, about that. All right, yeah. I just wanted to scratch the surface of that a little bit and talk about it. So, our motivation for our motivation is twofold for Bell Street and this district. One is Bell Street was built for those three purposes we identified. One of which is to make the property develop, right, and to, to that end, if we overcharge with too high of an interest or we start that interest too soon, at some point it be, could become a barrier to so that third Poorly, point, right? and yet it hasn't offloaded for a reason during that time, you'd think. Right, so, so I think we're not putting the interest on there because we want to make more money. It's more to incentivize the ultimate sale. So it seems to me deferring delaying the start of interest for a year or two might be prudent. It, we don't lose anything, right? The whole point is help those folks who are ready to develop to develop. I right. sure as heck don't like the interest while the moratorium's in place. Well, <laughs> that would maybe yeah. solve that problem as well. Um, and, and while we're looking at those things too, the other side of this is 20 years is a long time. I know we talked about it. We kind of said 20 years, but the reality is if the property had not sold, had been redeveloped in 18 years from now, we missed. <laughs> right. Do you want to miss? I don't want to miss. Yeah, I don't either. So maybe the term, maybe a shorter term, maybe delaying the interest a little bit. But I, th that's that's where I'm feeling there might be some wiggle. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, especially with the with Don, but especially with the moratorium piece. Um, I, I think that's a it's an unfair burden. That's not their fault um, that we have this issue. I'm uh, I am for the uh, the district itself, and I think that the that some of the recruitment cost needs to be done. But I also don't see the need to un unfairly burden the property owners when they're not even able to develop that. Thus, the property is even less right. desirable for right now. So um, 
I I at least would say um, that it wouldn't start until they can actually develop that property, which it would be quite right. Um, one other thing, uh, just real quick, I just want to get it out there. Um, and I know the answer, I just want it to kind of go on the record. Were there any grants that we obtained to build this road? There were not. So this is 100% City of Sandy funded. We were very nervous in February and March of 2022, uh, just with the way prices were going. And so Tyler and Jeff and Jordan applied for a raise grant for five million, I think. For a change. But yeah. And, and we found out later this summer, we didn't get it, but we were very relieved when we opened up, you know, we had four bids and the construction price was 9.3 million. So the project has stayed on track since 2022, you know, when we got to the 90%, but no, there were no grants. 100% city of Sandy funded via yeah. SDCs, general fund, Yes, loan, a loan, a 5.6 million loan uh, that we're loans, paying, yeah. still paying off and we'll be paying off how long? Right. Bonds loan? Uh, the full faith and credit bond. It's a 20 year. 20 years. So the next 20 years. We'll yeah. 18 more years of payment. Yeah. You want to say, uh, you just, you've gone first. Is there others real quick? Nope. Okay, please, Carl, and then Kathleen. So the whole piece of this is that we're trying to get this developed. I get the part about it's a benefit for our citizens to go be more able to get through the, the school uh, traffic, be able to have medical and emergency equipment, get there and back, and eventually develop uh, to more the parts of the city as it grows and such. Uh, all that it, it accepted, and this is part of the reason why we are only asking for 20% of the reimbursement, because I, even though I, I'm not sure I can defend 80% of it as part of the the city's benefit rather than the individual owner's benefit. But I, I do think we need to find a way to encourage development out there. In the long run, what will really make the city money is having commercial properties on these lots and single families and so on. The taxes and the re reimbursements, the fees that are going to be provided really will overwhelm mm -hmm. everything. And maybe the 20 years is a bit long to Specs that if we have empty property um, 15 years from now, we've really lost our opportunity. We've also not done what we want to do. So to me, it uh, makes sense to, about the moratorium. That makes a lot of sense. It's not their fault. So in, in my mind, I'm not sure that um, I would go much beyond the 20%, but the 20% sounds pretty good. And uh, with the modification of the moratorium, I think that makes some sense to it. I, I really want something out there. I really want to see a building of some kind on this. And uh, it seems that 20% reimbursement gets us in a lot of that category. Right. Thank you. Kathleen. Um, there was some mention about waiving the 5% till the development happens, at which point that's, I mean, then you don't make any interest no, on it because then it's all right. So that's so the whole purpose for the five percent was to cover the costs of what that money would make if it was banked or something like that. Um, the and, and and the concern I have is that you know the longer it it doesn't uh, get developed, um, our that money's not going into our uh, operations and maintenance fund that we need to refund. So that's a concern. Um, I understand that we've gotten some uh, good news on the whole, you know, how many units we're going to get from, and I don't want to talk about that because it's off topic, but I could see kind of, uh, like you all talked about, giving a little bit of a waiver till the moratorium ends. I think there's um, potential for I guess I'm a little concerned about the specifics of that because if we get a waiver for all of our pipeline, um, but all our pipeline doesn't develop, you know, that they have a year, they get so much time to develop under their existing proposals and we've been giving them extensions. And then once we kind of get that, the pipeline 
you know, permitted, then we should be giving them a one year extension and then, and then, you know, then they need to develop or, or not. But if they don't develop, then we should be able to be giving those ERUs or whatever to uh, something like this, I would hope, if we transfer those ERUs to this and give them the opportunity. So when there's the opportunity to get the uh, get ERUs to this place, I could see them, you know, delaying it to that point. I don't know if that's if that's the point where the moratorium goes off or not. But when there's an opportunity to provide them some ERUs for development is when I would like to, I, I could agree with that. I totally, you know, the, the reality is, is we've got a 20 year loan. We're going to be paying for this for 20 years. So um, I'm really feeling like, you know, 20 years is, you know, what we need because again, if it does, you know, we need the 20 years because this money is just going to refund our operations fund. And if we don't get it in 10 years, we're not getting it at all. We've already given them more than 80% of the cost of this project. So just grabbing back 20% of the project is in my mind, a huge gift to the landowners and, you know, and well worth it to the city and, you know, a win-win for everybody, but I'm not looking at going anything less than, I mean, I wanted more than 20%. I'll, be real honest. And I'm also feeling like the 5% is needed to try to cover the cost once the moratorium is is uh, passed. Kyle, I, I see it, it looked like you were wanting it. Yeah, I've heard a lot of, um, of notes about when the moratorium ends. And I think just for a point of clarification, and we can spit all this with um, our city attorney too, if we need to, but I think it maybe some better language around that would be at the time in which development applications can be accepted or something, because we don't know the definition of moratorium can mean different things. And we don't know what version or what, what iteration of the moratorium we're going to be in at any point in time. So um, I just want to be careful about the specificity of that language that we use because it, it could change very yeah. easily. Chris. We'll make a short statement, ask a clarifying question and continue my statements. We'll be that way. First is I absolutely think 362nd and Bell was much needed for the community. Say that. <laughs> and then my question for you, Jenny, is as I've been told, and as I went out and walked across the street, <laughs> the lanes are not wide enough today for two cars. So if cars are backed up and parked down 362nd, an emergency vehicle could not go by them if they wanted to. Is that an accurate statement? Are you referring to 362nd or Bell? 362nd. Is 362nd still? Um, I'm sorry, Bell. Bell. Okay. My, my, my mistake. <laughs> that, makes sense. Uh, that is true, yes. So that, that's my question. So with that, I think there's an easier way to say this. <laughs> Instead of worrying about moratoriums and worrying about the, the disadvantage, I think Carl's comment about emergency vehicle access has just been answered. We don't have it. So when we develop those properties, we're going to have to do something about increasing the road size because we're going to have even more traffic on those roads, which we're going to ask the developers to do because that's what we do for improvements when they take over the properties. The second piece is what Don mentioned about pricing ourselves out of the market. If we add this to the property owners today, then the property owners are going to add it to the sale of their price, right. which is going to add it to the developer, who's then going to add the increased SDCs that they've gotten that we've approved. And they're eventually going to build something that the customer can't afford, and they're going to price us out of the market. And then we're going to have buildings sitting vacant okay. because people can't afford the apartments that they're putting in today at the rent rates that they're offering today, much less than two years from now. So it, so in my opinion, increased SDCs, lane size, pricing ourselves out of the market, I'm pulling back my vote on this and I'm voting no because it's not going to be healthy for us. Now, I understand that by voting no, it doesn't replenish Jenny's operational fund. I think the increased SDCs is going to do that as we continue to allow builders to build, as we continue to no negotiate connections to our sewer pipe that we can allow building it's and we're, the, already those those high rates we've already set in place for SDCs are going to help us recoup some of that money and we have to do a better job and I agree I wasn't here when we did the S when we did 360 second and bell so I wasn't part of that research but I I do agree that 
I think that the road isn't set up the most efficient way today because it doesn't have the width that it needs to, to allow emergency vehicles, much less added traffic when you build a bunch of retail and commercial and, and residential space down that down that strip. Mm -hmm. Traffic's going to triple and it's not going to happen. So um, I'm I'm voting no. So I just want the group to know that. Can I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Don and Carl. So I think you're conflating SDCs with the street fund and they have different purposes. So this <clears throat> reimburses the street fund. SDCs are paying forward for new right. construction. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not, I'm, I told you I wasn't confusing because I told you that doesn't address the operational issues for re reimbursing that fund. Right. You have so to come up with other new, ways. New SDCs don't help the street fund. That's not but, but for new capacity. Right. It can, it, it can go, STCs can go towards new capacity. capacity. New capacity. Not, not current. Capacity. But it can't, it can't do anything to the street operations fund at yeah. all. Right. No, I, I know that. I know that. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I misheard you. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. No. Question for Carl and then Mark, please. Clarification. The, the right of way that we purchased for these roads, does it include additional space for additional lanes? So that, because I understood that one of the problems with this project was we had to pull from all kinds of different resources to make this thing happen just the way it is. Uh, I So the question is, is, do we have the ability to widen those lanes or add a lane on either side? In the future, where are we to get money? I would have to get back to you on that. I, okay. I don't know. Anymore. And why are we talking about this? It's not part of the this discussion. No, but it what it does is it, like there appears to be some con concern about if you got a car park there and on Bell, I guess I, I haven't measured it, but it seems to me that that's I think that's taken our eye off the ball. That's a little bit. It, it is a frustration. Well, I'll tell you, it's a frustration with our code because, you know, if they didn't have those center medians, a mm -hmm. emergency vehicle could mm -hmm. make it down. So right, that's, that's the that. truth. Yeah. I, I, I completely so, agree with, with the points. Made. Yeah, just, yeah, I, yeah. I feel that, like it's all still, I mean, that's sure. far deep. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, I understand. That's it. Yeah. Carl, I'm sorry. I just wanted you to be able to finish your thought. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm finished there. Uh, okay. Although I, I am not a, against the uh, center uh, gardens at all. Those are <laughs> for environmental <laughs> purposes. So. <laughs> well, well, I know. Yeah. Got to get it in there. So, so. Unlike Chris, I, I, I have been on council long enough and, and we had deemed, you know, this was our council goal getting this road in was like high, high, high top priority for all of these reasons. I'm on our own Sandy Speaks website, relieving comp chronic traffic bottleneck, mm -hmm. economic development, providing access to schools and promoting resiliency. So there's explanations of what each of those things mean and, and what we intended with that. Um, I am under the understanding, again, according to the site, that this has been part of the transportation projects since 1994, but I actually think it's been on oh the city project list since 1940. So this, is, this has been a long time goal of the city. Sure. So we have project funding that we've used and, and, you know, from vehicle registration fees to our fuel tax and whatnot. And Nowhere in anything that we've discussed with the public with this road has this reimbursement district been part of the conversation until now. Yep. And so to me, this negatively affects future development. It negatively affects the current property owners. And so like Chris, I will also be a no vote. Hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, I just have a couple questions. Uh, what is the interest on our, our bond or our money? I can get that for you in 30 seconds. While you do that, uh, I just have a question for, you know, my fellow counselors up here. And that is that uh, we've depleted our street fund by $2 million, over $2 million. And I, I'm all for figuring out something else. I, and, I, and I don't. I'm 100%, but I haven't heard any ideas of how we're going to punish that. SDCs isn't it, and that is literally putting it on the back of everybody that doesn't use it. Um, and that's putting it on the citizens that are here. When yet, if this would have developed naturally, development truly would have paid for itself, the developers would have been on the cost for this full, well, that's just today's money too. Who knows what it would look like 5, 10, 15 years down the road, however long, but you know, almost $13 million today. 
So, and and six hundred thousand dollars is currently budgeted uh, from the general fund. On top of that, so I I'm all for this. Like in, in another idea, I just haven't heard an idea, nor do I have one of a better way to replenish our fund and not make it so that we can't repair the streets for every other citizen it's in. Until there's a better idea, I, I just don't know it. I'm open for a weekend uh, session to yeah, come up with something. I, about that. That's I, not what this is about. I feel like I'm too new to, to give full depth of this, but I would love to sit and collaborate about other ways we can find money to reimburse it's really the street one. It's gas taxes. That's it. Yeah. It's like our only avenue that we have to replenish that fund. Reimbursement districts and and gas taxes. We, we can't do it with SDCs. Look, I don't think it's, I wish there was something else we could do. And I want to see it develop too, but my gosh, 80% that we paid, the citizens have already paid $600,000 of their tax dollars towards this on top of our street fund that's already out there as well. Like we, there's no better, there's no other way to do that. Now, if we want to have a discussion about raising our tax, our gas tax and that, fine, but talk about political ram, talk about community outcry over that. It's going to be much more than an AFRD. Well, I mean, I, I live in the community. I pay I pay those rates. I pay those taxes. But I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, I would not have I would not have voted as a citizen to spend the money if we didn't have the money to do it. But as a citizen, I would also have made a selective choice to say I want to invest in this property by spending this money to bring more business here. That's not on my back. That's on that's on on us as a as a council and that's what this council did is it made it laid its hand down and said i want to pay this money on our own for this road and we're going to bring developers in we didn't talk about having developers pay for it then we're, we're talking about it now so we did to the tune of 10 million dollars though we paid 10 million dollars for the development. We invested in ourselves that's, that's right. absolutely we, agree. we did not invest in ourselves because we never get it back we yeah. paid but we did not invest. That's an investment. No, that's a loss. Okay, fair, fair. We'll, we'll call it what it is. Well, I can see both angles but it, on that. Yeah, I can see exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see both sides but, of that. But, my, but, the but this is, is still a $10 million that we, well, when I say we, that the city has come up with. And all we're asking is for $2 million of that back. And there is no way that that wouldn't have been paid for had we not oh, yeah. let it develop naturally. It would be 100% on the back of the developers and thus yeah. the property owners and everything else. Here, here. I, I'm all for trying to help it out and I want this to develop. And I love the idea of where I think it's gonna hopefully go someday. But I just, we can't like, what we are, what I'm hearing right now from some of people is this is going 100% on the back of our Sandy citizens. And that's not right. That's just my view, I'll, I'll be quiet. Okay. Sorry, I got a little passion. <laughs> I just wanna briefly important. answer your question Thank that you, you asked. Um, Councilor Sheldon, so interest rate currently on the uh, bond for that project is 4%. We earned five and a quarter on our investment account. That's why the interest rate on the um, AFRD was proposed at 5% because two months ago when this was drafted, it was at 5%. And then lastly, just to um, uh, reiterate, one of the existing city council goals is to replenish the street fund to support future maintenance activities. And so this was one of those approaches to replenish the street fund. I just want to make sure we um, so we get, noted that. we get $1.7 million a year in gas tax. Is that correct? Um, That's the figure that No, you I think that is a biennium number that you just referenced, but um, I pull up my... And well, this is this, while you're looking that up, there's two allocations, right? There's our own city gas tax, and then there's our allocation from the state that we get on the right. state gas yep. tax. So yeah. jointly between both of those sources, we get, we have 2.4 million budgeted for the biennium. So about 1.2 million per year. Okay. But so my, my point is, is that that is being, that, that fund is being reestablished annually. That's my point. It's being reestablished annually, but you know, you've got somewhere in the ballpark of six to 800,000 of biennium that goes to street sweeping alone and street, you know, general just street cleaning and maintenance, the staff associated with um, all of our public works and, and street components, street light utility fees, um, as well as just general street fund maintenance, asphalt. Yeah. Uh, For you start seal, patching potholes and all the other mm -hmm. things people and have been so complaining. And that, the 
the project as yeah, well, no, the no, annual, no. the PMI right. annual overlay they project. They got a lively work in the I, I would just say that. Well, yeah. well, well that side gets to do a lot of talking to a lot of so it's okay. I'm okay with it. I would just say from a funding perspective, um, the street fund, especially given the direction with hybrid and electric vehicles going forward and the likely reduction in gas tax is going to face a serious budgetary issue over the next decade and not just sandy street fund but, but and, fund and, and not that this is cool. not that this is a popular comment but it is in reality i think is we could put our our general general fund off nothing stops us from putting general funds on street fund no, you can put general fund dollars wherever you want to. Right. Yeah, yeah. We're, I know. And right. it's not popular, like I said. No, but we're asking what we it's can an do. Option, right? yeah. We've already it's moved. Not, We've already put right. 600. I understood. I'm not, again, it's we're asking what saying. we can do, where we can move around. <laughs> and I just have an unpopular yeah. question. So yes. don't bash me or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to bash me. Kathleen's in the pipeline. What, yeah. what does one penny raise on our gas tax for the city equate to in dollars? We would get do you want an annual or a biennial and, number? And right. Annual so, number. If we increased it a penny, we'd get another hundred and fifty thousand. No, that's what I wanted to know. Okay. Yeah. okay, for starters, um, when I first got on council and I was aware of this project, I raised the questions about how do we get some of the costs for this reimbursed to the city because i felt like you know it's a great project definitely start spur the development and all that but i was you know asking about what are the tools and that's how we learned about the afrd so that's been on the agenda since i've been on city council um so this isn't the first time we're hearing about it. i don't know about for you but i've been speaking about that's it for how we pay time. for gunderson Road. right and so so the other part of that though is that again to kind of echo some what Rich said is that were we not to build this, the developers would have to build it, and you would have the, the landowners would have gotten even much less for their land because the cost would have been much more, and they would have had to have that taken out of how much they get for their land. So we paid ten million, and actually we paid more because of all Jenny and Mike Walker's you know staff time. That that don't know how much that was, but you know it's been years working on it, major project. I feel like we've got the people who who benefit in this room from this largesse, basically ten million dollars, but we don't have the rest of this the residences. And I purposely didn't go out and make this a big deal about like, hey, this is what we're deciding. I feel like if we're really talking about not passing this, it is going. It, you know, I I hear these comments about the conditions of our roads, and I feel like that that you know i was suggesting more than 20 percent, but i can agree with 20 percent. but i feel like that's the bottom line for me and we need to be start telling you know, the rest of the residents who are on the hook for that and, and not going to see the snow plowing and the patch hot hole patching and all the other stuff that we need to pay for those kind of things <clears throat> we're saying that no you can't have that because we're giving all the money including the $2.4 million to these developers. And I don't, I don't want to go on the record as that. And, and, I, and I think if that's what we're talking about doing, we need to have a, a much better PR, you know, uh, we need to get that out to in our, in our Sandy swords and everything else so that people can kind of weigh in on that because that's being transparent. We're saying that $2.4 million is coming out of everybody's pocket for their streets and that they're paying for. And I don't agree with that. I think it needs to be coming out of this. I think this is the least we could have done. So I'm really frustrated and concerned that, you know, we, my whole thing that I ran on was that developers need to pay for their development. That's what I heard from all the, the residents as I got votes from was that they felt like developers should be paying more instead of sticking it to us, to the residents. So I, I'm going to be. I agree with you, Councilor Walker. Let's extend, let's extend this out. Let's yeah. not do it today. Let's let's push it out. Let's talk about it more. Let's be more let's transparent. Let's bring the people in. Let's hear their word. Let's yeah. hear their voice. I I, I, I think do we're some more. Sorry, let's go. Carl, <laughs> Carl's next. Everybody, take a deep breather. Deep breather, and then we're going to go to Carl, and and then we're going to go to Doc. Yeah, I, a, a couple of things. Um, the unfortunate business about being here long enough that you've seen some of these things 
come back through again and again. And we have talked about a reimbursement district. Uh, you, you may not remember, you may not um, know about it, but we did talk about it as part of the process of building the 362nd bill. It, it didn't really come to fruition until finally we get the road into place. And now we have, what are we going to do to pay for it? I think that's something that has to be thought through a little bit. And secondly, the citizens of this community, this has been sitting since, I don't know, maybe 1940. I, I was not even born in 1940, Me unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's not true, but that is. Um, but it has been a desire of the city for a long time since I've been here, which is the mid eighties. And I know that's not as old as some folks have been, but it has been a desire by the citizens. And it has been something that I think the citizens look at as a positiveness to the city. And, and I also agree with Kathleen in that it is a benefit to the people who the road goes through. It's gotta be something that's an advantage for the selling of those properties, the developing of those properties. Other cities can be, other cities have done this thing and have done it in the format that we are proposing for it and have developed their properties. And it isn't been that much of a prohibitive monies to be able to get forward on it. I would love to see it be zero. I, I would love to say, we'll just pay for the whole thing out of the city, but I don't see how, uh, was it like six, seven years ago, we tried to make a, I think it was a three cent tax increase on taxes and we got voted down. I, it's like 70%, I think it wasn't we close. 73%. It was a lot. <laughs> so if you want to try that, I think it's going to have to be a big sale. Um, I'm not saying that it's been done now. Uh, there were things we didn't do in those days, but um, it, it's a tough sale. Uh, and then lastly, I think we just do need to be able to find some way to get, uh, I, I'm aware of sidewalks and potholes and places that we've said no to because we just don't have the money in our mm -hmm. accounts for years now. And, uh, and it's been a few years because we've been putting that aside, 362nd and Bell. So I, I think we do need to get some reimbursement, minimal though it may be, some so I, I'm I'm probably I'm going to be voting yes. We're going to shoot to well, it depends what the motion is, right? Yeah, right. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have to say, anyway, no. uh, uh, acting to others. Yeah, right. uh, let's go to Don, and then I'd like to I'd like to take a moment to weigh in as well. Okay. So breathe. <laughs> when when we got elected, the Rich and Kathleen and I came on council three and a half years ago. The Bell Street project was already well underway. Several, uh, myself, Kathleen, weren't real happy with the project. We inherited it. Um, probably wouldn't have voted for it had that, you know, happened later rather than before. But it was a prior council. We supported it. It needed to happen. And and sometimes you just have to swallow the bitter pill and, you, you know, you move on. And so that's great. But then we have the cost overruns and they hit and they hit. And what do we do? We faithfully vote for them because now we're into it. What are we going to do? Stop the project, you know, because we, because we we run out of money. We had conversations about how to recover that money back then, and we kind of punted it. Well, this is that day. We are the here now, where back then we said yes, we we're going to build that road, but now's the time to come back to that and now figure out why. Why every man, woman, and child in Sandy should have paid a thousand dollars because that's roughly what it costs to build that road. Every man, woman, and child in the city, and all we're asking back from not these homeowners, not these landowners, but the people they ultimately sell the property to, if and when they choose to sell it, those developers. That's who we're asking to reimburse two hundred dollars for every man, woman, and child. That's that's the that's where the numbers come out. And so if we don't do this, then that's other money we have to raise through mechanisms we don't even know, can't even come up with. Or what we really do is just punt more maintenance so that our roads 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road will be facing the same thing as our sewer system because we didn't do the maintenance the time we should have. We have to have the money to maintain it. This is very important to us. 
I feel like Kathleen, 20% is the minimum. We should have gone more, but that competing objective of keeping that property marketable, that's important. Mm -hmm. And I think 20% is all right. And I think, Council Mayton, I think you misrepresented the compounding factor. And maybe you didn't mean to, and maybe I just misheard it. But it's it gets tacked on once to whoever comes forward with that land application. At that point in time, that cost. And the biggest chunk is the uh, 36405, 1.4 million. That's a big chunk, but that's the biggest property. How is it how is it once, Councillor? Because if you build a road, you create an increased value for the current property owner. So the increased value for the current property owner, they then sell it at a higher rate to the developer. So that's that's cost increase one. And then the developer comes in and they've got a high SDC. And then they've got this, this AFD or the I have the wrong acronym. Then you have, then you increase it again. It it's a it's a compounding factor that will increase whatever they build. And again, I'm I'm not arguing the semantics on where the money's gonna come from because I honestly don't know. But I'm yeah. I'm so let me let me wrap up. So you're, it's a fair question. So it's the compounding is that the property value without a road had a certain value. We build a road, that value goes up. Correct. We never had, and commercial appraisals have been talked about are highly and the developer doesn't have to build the road anymore either. The developer right. doesn't have to build it. So any developer coming in would have to build that. And if a developer came in, as has been explained, if Len, uh, Mr. Lundin sells it, somebody comes in, develops that large piece of property, that developer builds the majority of that road, he's going to put in a reimbursement district for whoever comes after to help reimburse him for that road. That's all we did. We're the developer in that case. So to kind of bring this home, none of this affects the landowners that are sitting here today. It will affect their heirs or how they sell it or potentially how it gets marketed. But when we look at the value of that likely property to a big box store or those other kinds of things that come in, the amount of money we're tacking on here is not going to prohibit that sale or make that not attractive to that future developer. That's, and that's something we talked about in our work session. That's why we landed on this percentage. So I, I think this is, we got to do this. We got to do it for sanity and for the future. And that, that's where I'll, I'll leave it. Okay. Can I have one quick well, clarification question too? All right. I'd love to get in here at some okay. point. But I just want one question. Yeah. For paying back the loan that we have, the 5.6 million, is that coming out of SDCs or our street fund? We bonded against the vehicle registration fee. Okay. And so it's, it's the capital department of the street fund, which is comprised of vehicle registration fees, SDCs. So that's our street so it's, maintenance. It's operations. Yes, yeah. Oh, well, okay. So now before I go, I just, I need to ask a clarification on that. Okay. So what you're saying, we, we didn't bond against all the vehicle registration mm -hmm. fee and all the gas tax money. Not gas we, tax. Uh, I mean, uh, but the, uh, the money coming off of the, the transportation bill that went, we bond we bonded off the increase so we bonded off of the new the increase in the vehicle registration fee we bonded off the because you can only get you can only bond off new revenue new consistent revenue correct so there was a wasn't there there was not a vehicle registration fee or there was we, but they had raised it and then it changed the distribution of how those funds right were distributed we weren't receiving vehicle registration fee dollars right prior to so that. okay so that's where i'm going that's so, another, we, that's so we've source. had all this conversation about the street fund and raiding the street fund we didn't raid the, the existing street fund we so-called bonded against future money that was increased and in coming in newly in the street fund. For that bond, yes. That's for, separate from the 2.4, I don't have the number in front of me, the, the operations 5. Supp 5. that supplemented the overall. Out of the street fund? That was yeah. out of the street fund. Okay, okay. But I just want to make yeah. sure we're all very clear on where it's coming from. All right. On to the Okay. AFRD. Uh, first is, is uh, not opposed to AFRDs. Very much for AFRDs. 
Uh, it's the re it's the way before half the council was on council. The old council was voting to pay for Gunderson Road and other projects was through the establishment of these advanced finance reimbursement districts. Now, why do I like them? I like them because they take road projects and projects that might not come online because we're waiting for the development and we can now put it online and bid it against the future development that's coming to help pay for it. So Gunderson Road, we were able to start the construction. We got the new uh, development in there that helped offset some of the costs for that. And we sit in a better place today. Man, as been talked about here, we have been waiting for Bell Street 362nd in this community for a really long time. And so to do it, we did, we invested and we built, we, we paid to build that. And we had conversations to Don's point all along the way about an advanced reimbursement district to help offset some of that investment because we were getting <laughs> far ahead of ourselves for being able to invest in this. But why did we do it? We knew it impacted a huge portion of our community. We had a huge chunk of properties on the west side of town we wanted to see come online in development for the future of our community. We wanted to see them develop for our neighbors, for the property owners, and for our budget. And to get the ink, all the money we're talking about flowing into these budgets to get those to develop and to get the money in. Now, all of that said, there's a lot that's happened uh, since I got elected mayor, since this was a big priority of mine and others, uh, since we started talking about the reimbursement district. COVID-19 um, happened and the closures and the pandemic happened and inflation happened and all these cost overruns and, and um the moratorium happened. And we've just had a lot of conversations going on about development in our community and how hard it's going to be able to be able to develop in this community, the timing of things being able to develop. And I sit in a place as mayor where I'm really nervous about these properties that I want to see come online, about the time that they're going to be able to develop. Um, and if they don't develop what it means for our future budgets and being able to get those tax dollars in, uh, as I hear the debate and I weigh these factors, I'm just going to land on a couple of things. I'm going to kind of lay things out as I see them from this discussion, because I think there's several ways the council can go, some of which are going to bring me along, some of which you may leave me in the dust. But as we make our motions, I want to lay out where I can go and where I can't go and, and where I see it, Okay. As I see conversations, I think you probably could get to four votes to table this motion. <laughs> okay, I think it's probably a four three vote to table this motion tonight. With me, we can, you can get my vote. You may not need my vote for this, but with me, you can get my vote at 10% and with no 5% interest accumulation at the 20 years. You lose me at 20%, at starting the 5%, um, you, you lose me on that vote, okay? I think you could, I don't know, I can't for anyone, you could probably get this thing past the 20% without my vote. But if you want my vote and the mayor's support, you're at 10%, at 5%, at, and not doing the 5%. Um, so yeah, I think we could table it. You could go, uh, someone making a motion could go for their 20% and maybe do it, I don't know. But I think you get really strong council support. And I think you, pr you, you probably start to get that unity factor you want mm -hmm. at 10%, getting rid of the 5%. Kathleen. Well, if we're talking about tabling it and coming back to this, then it the twenty percent is open for me, and I'm looking at you know getting support in this community for more than twenty percent, because I think there's a lot of residents who think twenty percent we should have gone higher. So, I would like to make a motion that we um, pass resolution twenty twenty four dash twenty eight zero zero number eight. yeah twenty twenty four zero eight mm -hmm. with the change of the language that you mentioned, um, Tyler, about the moratorium uh, 
the development opportunity. When this starts, development yes. applications. Yeah. I would like to Josh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I would like to move to adopt resolution 2024-08 with the change of in language with the de development opportunity timeline rather than the moratorium. Is that clear? That's, so that's the you're drawing the five percent. No, I, I, I'm just till the till there's the, opportunity okay. for development. The term would still be twenty years. Twenty percent, twenty years, and five percent once there's opportunity for development. And I'm not to be. I just want to clarify. That's what I mean when I say drop the five percent. I mean at that at that stage. I'll okay. second that. Just test that. So make sure we got that figured out. So as described. But the moratorium scenario, 20%, no 5% until the fall until we accept applications. And for 20 years. And, and, I've got a second. and I would say, if the, and it's a second. And I would say, and we're in the discussion phase. Can I clarify something before? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we're in the discussion. Then I'll go to you. Oh, but okay. but, uh, but I, I would say if this doesn't pass, is that you're probably likely to get a, another motion in front of you that's at the exact same term for that 10%. So as people are weighing that, please, Rich. I just want to clarify that I know we said when development applications are accepted, but I would like it to just to be perfectly clear that development applications can be accepted for those specific properties. Sure. So I, I also kind of want to make it clear that um we're kind of at we're kind of at a, in a weird spot right now but uh, you know there's there's multiple properties out there and so if one comes to be to fruition you know we all of a sudden get some okay some eru's and we can hook it up right but the other ones are not allowed to for whatever reason i think that should play into effect as well that's where i'm trying to go with that that I don't know how to word that language exactly, but does that make sense? It does. I would love to take just a brief minute to have Josh yeah. jump in and make sure that uh, some of the ideas that are being passed around well, pass his legal. Uh, but does that make muster? sense? To you yeah, guys? no, I, I think I'm with you there. So if, if yeah, one property can develop, but the other one can't, I don't want the other one to get hammered and yeah, turn it it's, it's a feasibility mm -hmm. question. Yeah, I, I understand the the question, I, I'm struggling to think of how the city is going to be able to define that in the resolution language because the, the as you discussed previously, the moratorium is unlikely to be just a, a switch off, right? And so there's not going to necessarily be a clear line where um, everybody on these properties is able to develop. I guess it, 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 it may be a situation where, where we'll have to um, take this as direction from council to come up with some language and bring it back. I don't know that we're going to be able to draft this on the fly. It, it is, but it isn't. Thanks, Chris. I just, since we're in the discussion phase and hearing your, your options, Mayor, um, I originally, when we started this, said I would, I would go for 10%. And I, I listened to the arguments uh, from those voting for it at 20%. And I, I do understand because I don't have the answers for how to solve the operational um, shortage that we need to get the money. And I'm, I'm a, as a Sandy resident, longtime Sandy resident, I don't want to pay more money for it. Um, and I, I do think developers pay fair share, in my opinion. I would absolutely vote for the 10% and dropping five. I'm just making that no. I'm still a no at 20. Uh, drop five at, at forever? Drop just five. Drop five until? Until it's sold or okay. developed. Okay. Or, or develops it. Well, then you're essentially dropping it. So, so, motion. so, but you have a motion at 20 per, Okay, so we have a motion in front of us that we will do a, conduct a roll call vote on. And to clarify the motion is that the motion is a uh, 20-year term, 20%. And we're motion maker. What are we doing with five percent? Um, <laughs> well, I second yeah, it. is that well, yeah. is the language that when the moratorium is ended? Yeah, Josh, is it cleaner if the language? I'm going to spitball here, and you refine this with me. But um, at at a point in time, which development applications 
can be accepted for these properties. And that's not as um, clear as Councillor Sheldon had indicated as far as when there's, you know, available ERUs or what happens to neighboring properties, but it's a, that, that's a more finite timeline, right? When development applications can be accepted, I think is something we could massage. Right, so it, it was Councillor Sheldon's uh, suggestion that I, I can't quite come up with a way to to draft. Um, a few clear line options would be one, when the city begins to accept new land use applications. Another option would be when the city begins to accept new land use applications and has at least X ERUs available. Um, that could be a way to get close to what Councillor Sheldon was asking about. Uh, you could say when the moratorium ends, but that doesn't seem to quite align with what um, the desire is here. Okay, so would um, an amendment be that when the, um, do we have we have an estimate of how many ERUs did full development of this parcel could could have? Do we have that? I think that's impossible to determine just given the unknown of maximum what capacity. Could be I think Josh provided the language though, right? When we're able to start a reopen for applications, begin to accept new land use applications. applications. Let's go with that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. But but aren't we? You can modify the motion. No, that's not what I was saying. Um, I think. Um, what I could say, what I could say briefly to um, your point is that we will likely have availability with ERUs at some point in the future, but to ensure development of everything at this site, that's an impossible thing for us to determine because we don't know square footage of building, the use of the building, anything like that. So Will people feel okay with amending it to say that the 5% starts in year 10? Is that an amendment to the motion? What happens if it that, starts before that? Five percent starts in year ten. So, sorry, Linda, the, the public hearing is closed. This I know it's special just for what I'm asking for, or for the non-acronymic speakers out here, ERUs. If you could use less in acronyms okay. and well, say what they are, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's fair. fair. Thank you fair. for that. Yeah. Do you want to try? You want to do the yeah, ERU I, one? I can. Uh, I don't know if we can even do it, Linda. <laughs> I, can, I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Jenny, do you want to go for a hookup? Yes. Sewer it's connection. It's a sewer connection. Equivalent, residential. Equivalent, equivalent residential unit. So a single family home is an equivalent residential unit. I know what it is. Oh, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> but if you have a brewery, that might be like, four, it has to do with the load and the flow eventually. That How goes. much water and sewer goes Exactly, yeah. exactly. And we have a chart that we have to follow within the consent decree that we entered into with the Department of Justice. So it's very <laughs> explicit as to what an ERU equates to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to modify the motion. Okay, yeah. So I'd like to modify it so that instead of tying it to this other language, we just go start interest five years out. After today, after the order is accepted, we start the interest five years. The other terms would remain the same, 20% for 20 years. And you're assuming that in five years, we'll have a fair amount of the ERUs that be able or to move forward the on that. council here at the time is yeah. mm -hmm. Oh, well now there's something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once, once it's in place, you can't, you can't return to it. Sure. You know. Oh, uh, that's not my understanding. Yeah. Josh, do you want to speak to that? I couldn't quite hear that question. There's a couple of people talking once, I think. Amend an AFRD on in the future. Amend an AFRD? Yeah. Your your code doesn't currently have currently have a process to be able to do that now. So and you're just set. So yes, Carl, to your point. We're assuming years. that we are. At five years we've fixed our problems or close enough. Oh, you, you, know, you better have. have. Yeah, you and I have been on this. Yeah, advisory. All right. Well, that can so that's my motion. motion. That's the motion. motion. You got to. You're gonna have to make a decision. You need on that a call. second. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm. I'm listening for the yeah, motion. There's a motion. He needs a second. But we have a motion too. By I mean, in order of motions. Okay. All right. Are you withdrawing your motion? I'm. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, part of me is like, you know, I could also just go along with eliminating the five percent to get the twenty percent. So. So the options are withdraw it or second it. Or ten percent and eliminate. Ten, I, I will. Um, I will second it. I will we'll withdraw my motion it. and second your motion. Okay, that's fine. So now we have. A, so why don't you clarify your motion for the rest of council? All right. Well, the motion. motion. 
the, two, the three elements of the terms, we would accept this um, AFRD with a 20 year term, 20% uh, interest, interest <laughs> in five years after the acceptance of or the beginning of the year for AFRD. Not 20% interest, 20%. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. 5% interest, 20 year term, but the interest starts five years later. Okay. All right. Thank so, unless you. there's further discussion, of course, Chris is second. Chris motion. is, well, there's a second motion teed up ready to go mm -hmm. um, with a second, but we've, we've got to place an order. So, we have two motions in front of us. We're going to vote on the first, then we're going to vote on the second. Roll call vote. Um, and to quit, we allow Don to do his. Do you want to clarify yours before we get, before we go? Mine would be a twenty-year term at ten percent, and uh, eliminate the five percent until the property is developed or sold. Okay. Can I, ask, I just want what's twenty years at ten percent? Half that amount of money. So instead of a two point four million dollar AFRD of one point two, mm -hmm. one point two four million. And just clarify. But what's the twenty year if there's no a if there's no percentage? What's the what's the twenty year? Uh, uh, yeah. So after the twenty years in this scenario, the district would just dissolve if the property is sold or developed in twenty years in one day. They wouldn't pay anything for well, this project. Thank you. Can but I, if, what's the developed and sold part? How does that fit? Because. The interest becomes payable when it comes to the land. So with interest, I don't think it's growing when it's sold. From my understanding, and maybe Jenny can clarify, it's it's indifferent. But she said, I thought I heard her say that the five percent doesn't get applied until it's developed or sold. So it's irrelevant. It um you, you did hear me say that, but I, I think it was taken out of context. I I think one of the worries people had was they would owe, you know, every year they'd get a bill for five percent. But they don't. The five percent, as this was presented, would start accruing if this were passed right. tonight, every year. So if a developer brought in a land use application a year from today, whatever the area would be, you'd tack on five percent, and they would pay that when they paid their land use application. And, and my suggestion was to not pay that at all okay. until they actually take possession and build and develop the land. So there's so, no accrual of the 5%. So there would be so no, there would be no, no interest. There would be no interest. Well, no no interest. Well, she did have said that. No interest. Yeah. 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 I did. I did say that. You did say that. 10 years and no interest. So we're, so we're, okay. So, 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 so 20 years, 10%, no interest. Okay. Seconded by Lori. First motion, Don's motion at, Kathleen motion modified by Don, seconded by Kathleen. Uh, roll call vote, Jeff. Hey, Councilor Meaton. Which one am I voting? This is yeah. the first Kathleen. motion. It's the first, the first motion. motion. No. Councilor Smallwood. No. Councilor Sheldon. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Councilor Exner. Yes. Councilor Hokinson. Yes. Mayor Pulliam, no. Mayor, that's four yeses and three noes. All right, motion passes. All right, thank you, everybody. Moving ahead on the agenda, we will. Oh, I gotta get re acquainted here. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the presentation, the staff. Thank, thank you, you to everybody who came and testified. Thank you. Um, all right, moving ahead. Tyler, report from the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Do you want to give that mind if I yeah, just yeah, hold off a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, and then you were laughing at me, and I was like, so I said, well, only so many calls to question, actually. That's actually not true. Yeah, actually, I would love a coffee over this topic. Seriously, I, I would do it. Great coffee, but I'm ready for something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Eric. Good night. Good night, Deb. Somebody left you that back and forth. So did I. Okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe she did. Is that a bag in the back also, Lori? What no. that? To the no. right? Is there something in the far right? Back? Oh, it's, just a, it's a big bag. That's our. That's our. 
Oh, okay. They're big right. things. You lost them all. No one wanted to stay for my exciting report, apparently. <laughs> we could leave too if you want. <laughs> I'll be brief. Okay, yeah, then I'll stick around. Um, so first thing I wanted to just inform you all of there is there was rather a um uh Plaquemines City's dinner scheduled for May 2nd in Malala that has been canceled. Oh. Don't know if you got the oh. email or not. No. I just wanted to give you a heads up that that's not going to be happening. I don't have further information other than they didn't have adequate attendees, I believe, is what was huh. um, messaged to us. I haven't heard anything beyond did that. Did you actually get me on the list this time, Jeff? I did. <laughs> and then I put it, canceled it. No, no. <laughs> it might be. It might be. <laughs> okay. Oh, so just, that's that is kind of a bummer. Yeah. Um, let's see, the SEI is due today. I don't know how many of you have completed. We can't see that on our end who's done it and who hasn't, but a reminder, if you have not, please finish that up tonight. Oh, I did it the first day. No, it's wrong people. I did it three days ago. I mean, this is a break. And then last but not least for me, um, you know, we've talked a lot about parks in the recent year or two, um, from, uh, Cedar Park to existing parks to Deer Point Park. And one of the questions that Councillor um, Smallwood specifically has mentioned is, how are you going to take care of them once you build them? Um, and so I just wanted to give a brief update on parks staffing and um, a plan that we have um, that we're ready to put into motion. So the existing budget by NAM 2325 did have an additional FTE budgeted for the last six months of the biennium, which would have been um, starting late December of this calendar year. We've done a lot of budget review and trying to, um, uh, you know, pinpoint exactly what the needs are for the parks department, what money we have available. And we do have um, the opportunity right now to transition our seasonal um, summer position that we would have, bring that on as a full-time FTE. Uh, so about six months earlier than what was in the budget, but we have the funding available. The net difference is only about 22,000 or so that we need to come up with and we have that in the um, parks and recreation budget. So we're planning on moving forward with um, getting a, a, an additional full-time um, parks maintenance worker that will, one, do all the summer work that we already have to do and had a seasonal carved out to do. Um, we'll have an additional FTE on board um, for the late fall when we're setting up for Winterfest and all of our post-summer activity, pre-winter things. Um, and then that'll just slide right into the grand opening of Cedar Park when we're going to need another body to help maintain those, um, you know, developed park acres that are over there. And then shortly after that, we'll have another park at Deer Point. Um, so this probably isn't the, the end of a discussion around parks FTE, but I know it has been a, a point of question and concern as to how we're going to maintain the assets that we do have. And so we do have this plan in place now that we're ready to move forward with. I see maybe a couple of phases that I want to ask questions. So I'm happy to take those or just uh, talk to you one-on-one -on -one later, whatever is convenient or comfortable. Well, it's not going to be enough. It's a start. It's a start. It, it, yeah, but it doesn't fix our problem. We know that we have several facilities and our parks crew takes care of our facilities as well as all the parks. Um, there's been it, a lack of... Uh, if it's a, a road maintenance, is that a park maintenance or a public works maintenance? If it's a, a what? Road I'm just curious if it's uh, like it's one of these medians and it's weeding one of them. Like, oh, that one? Yeah, so it depends. I yeah, yeah, no, it's I a great question. Yes, it depends. Yeah. Um, actually, I can give you a brief update on that too. So medians, for example, um, Jewelberry median, medians on Highway 26, medians on uh, Bell, those are all part of the street department's functions. They're within the transportation um, right of way. The median that is um, uh, Avril, Avril Parkway, I think I say it wrong every time I say it. That one has, for whatever reason, I, I can't speak to why it's been determined a parks median, but go. for whatever reason, that has been historically maintained by parks. I think there's a lot of just uh, odd divvying up of some things that have happened because of the staff we had in the past and who could take on this added chore and who could take on that added chore. So, I mean, that's a valid question as to, you know, who does what. Um, I'd like to see part of that addressed in what you're trying to do. Yeah, and there's, um, we actually have a plan we're working on that right now. Tiana's gotten, um, a bid from our existing landscaping company to see what it would cost to add a few other spots in town that are chronic um, issues that we just don't have the capacity to maintain. 
Um, modifying that contract does come with some other cost savings because we'd be adding some additional work to it. And so um, I don't have final numbers yet, but we do have a plan in place to uh, better maintain some of the medians that are chronic. But you have a lead whacker person for the public works, right? Seasonally, seasonally or seasonal. yeah, there is a seasonal street employee. Right. I don't you guys don't live on the main road like on bluff, but and I think they are they on already? Uh they are not. No. Okay. I thought somebody left part of my weeds today. We I mean we've had public works crew really trying to yes, hit what did. they can. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, okay, so what it is is they go along and, and whack all the weeds in the drainage ditch on the right road right away. And you know, and they do the medians. I mean, they used to, I don't know if they did the medians though. I don't know if that was in their scope of work. Always Not usually. Out. I mean, oftentimes it was, you know, an 18 year old fresh out of high school. Right. The medians, especially on Highway 26, are a challenge. You need more than one person because you've got someone either driving a truck or blocking off the lane of the highway or, you know, trying to right. provide that safety buffer there. Um, so historically, the, the street summer help has not done those. Um, more dangerous, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, median work. But. but I guess it seems like we're trying to give more street work to the parks folks, and we're that doesn't feel right to me. I mean, I feel like if we already have a street person, we and the public works needs more to do the medians and all that that they that we have to have. Then I, I guess I don't. I mean, I, I'm all for working together, mm -hmm. but everybody's stretched thin, and so. Yeah, and and maybe I didn't. Um, make this very clear. So the work that Tiana is doing and getting a quote with our existing landscaping company for future median maintenance, she's just taking the contract lead in those conversations. Okay. It's not the parks crew or the parks budget that's picking up those street, um, those street medians, but we needed one point of contact instead yeah. of yeah. two or three. And she manages the um, landscaping contract for all the facilities. And so it made sense for her just to sort of lead those contract discussions, but it would still be paid for out of other okay. sources. Yeah. Much better. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. A little bit of a tangent thrown in there, but that's all I got. <laughs> Any uh, update on Tick Creek Trail opening? Uh, I do not have a date. I know that, um, uh, I forget the tree care company's name. I don't want to say the wrong one. Um, was it Oregon Tree Care? I saw them out there today. That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't want to <laughs> misspeak. Uh, I knew they were coming out this week. I didn't realize they were already out today. So there's a couple more um, rounds of some hazard trees that need to be cleaned up, but we're getting much closer. And for those that are listening, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions about why isn't it open? And the answer is because of those hazard trees. It's, you know, like a bunch of matchsticks that have fallen. And at any point in time, if that one branch that's holding up this tree gives way and you've got a whole other domino effect. And so it's really from a standpoint of safety and, and caution that we want to make sure all those hazardous trees are removed safely and correctly before we reopen. Yeah. Thank Carl. you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, not Carl, man. John, I just said, you've, I've had enough. You've had enough of me, man. Carl's enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've probably jumped too much. But I do have a couple of things. So first of all, um, I don't like more three votes. It's not my favorite. But, and I didn't want to bring it up because I don't felt feel like it mattered in the hearing, but I still remain very much in favor of Sura looking at this and adding some economic incentives to offset what we just put on those landowners because it helps it to me it's it's the right use of urban renewal money and it keeps the street fund solvent so this i, I hope there's i hope that's more of a 7-0 kind of discussion we can have in the future and hopefully we can have it sooner because some of those folks would it'd be nice for them to know that that we would have some sort of incentive for programs to two properties. Pardon? I think it only applies to two properties. Yeah, but it's but it's the one point four million dollar one, which is the yeah, big, yes, you yeah. know. So, um, I, yeah, that that is a good point. Uh, second issue, um, we have the new parking lot, and the for sale signs are down, and now it's just a big empty homeless potential homeless camp. So, my question to you is whether you know now or whether you need to research it, don't really care. But what rules do we have in place in terms of ordinance to prevent it from turning into an overnight parking lot or uh, homeless camping or so forth? 
you know, what rules do we have and how do we get signage on it to make sure those rules are communicated to people who now know that AEC is not looking anymore. Yeah, so what I can tell you um, just offhand, and there's probably a little bit of research I need to do to answer your question um, fully, but offhand, we've talked about um, the signage that needs to be ordered. I don't know if that's been ordered yet or if it's just been instructed to be ordered, but no uh, camping, no overnight parking, um, just to be clear and direct when I get that posted. Um, I don't have ordinance language in front of me, but the same ordinance language that applies to our other parking lots would apply to this one as well. It doesn't specifically call out Heritage Square parking lot. It just says parking, you know, in general. And so those um, restrictions would apply to this yeah. lot as well. Can it lock overnight? I was wondering that. Should we just lock? It has there? the potential to lock overnight. Yeah, I mean, well, you're going to keep out of there those people living in the cars. You're not going to keep anybody from camping in there. We're getting camping behind the white buildings at times, too. We've had some people yeah. doing drugs back there and other things. Yeah, and that one, and at least my... knocked them out, at least recently. Yeah, the recent one that they've uh, found permanent housing and they've been relocated right. uh, and that vehicle's been towed. Um, preventing overnight parking or camping or abundance of litter or, or, or whatever those negative visual um, things are is definitely been a conversation we've had a lot internally about how to prevent that. It's the last thing I want is a very nice, flat, well-maintained parking lot to turn into right. a problem spot, especially yeah. and we've also, further into the downtown area. We also talked about monetizing it for special events and things, and I would like to see you explore that. I know there's uh, real easy solutions that some cities are going to where it's online only. You know, yep. they download the smart app, Downtown's pay, the, that. pay the fee, yep. and you don't have to have the meter box, no credit card processing. It's all just online. Perfect. That seems like a really good thing that we could do is you know it's, at least for special events yeah. you should do that with all of our birth mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay great oh, thank you carl uh jenny's gone and i just wish that she was still here i would just really want to compliment her on the negotiations with the city of portland i know how uncomfortable that is um, had a very small piece of that many years ago and it never is fun but we got the cheapest rate in the list of those who are still in the system. So yes, really, Jenny, if you're listening or people can tell her later on, I really appreciate that. This is, I have a dog in this fight, <clears throat> so I'm gonna um, talk about it anyway. Council has talked about getting our rate increases small, but often, and, and my dog in the fight, this is I pay the transit tax every year late, faithfully and abundantly. I don't want to see it go really big all of a sudden. Is there some talk or thinking about making small increases as are needed or whatever that process would be? I guess I would not want to see a jump in horrendous amounts. Are you just specifically transit taxes? What your that's, question? that's the one that just came up in the, in the um, um, consent decree. I was reading in there the conversations about the transit uh, process and so on. I was just thinking, I haven't seen anything for transit tax for many years. And I, and I pay it. We have not I pay it. We have not increased the transit tax rate since it was implemented. Um, we have no plans to do so. We're able to, you know, fortunately, Andy and just transportation in general has a lot of grant funding. And so they're able to do the great work that they do, funded mostly with um, grant funds and a small match from that transit tax. And so at the current time being, there we continue no to operate hey, I'm not going to argue. I said, um, I pay that every year. And, at yeah, some point, there may need to be a conversation about that, um, but not in the near future. Okay, all right. And we talked about it earlier, and I try to keep my mouth shut because I know it takes a lot of time and energy to talk about lots of different things. But the medians in Jewelberry, they really look rough. I mean, they're really starting. To, mm -hmm. they got dead trees. They have tall grass, and I'm sure fall will be fire danger. And they just look terrible. Overgrown. We need to get that worked out. And thanks for trying to figure out who's supposed to be responsible for that. And we won't even talk about the stuff in front of the Forest Service. I'll let it go. It's been mowed recently. Yeah, it's starting to get tall again. And it's certainly not the same quality as the little triangle there at Bluff. Anyway, I'm done. Yeah. Um, I want to, yeah show some appreciation for Jenny and the work she did getting those um, that that's a huge, you know, agreement for us 30 years. 
And also um, the um, recognize y'all that did the um, ribbon cutting on the cedar uh, trail. Mm -hmm. So that that was very well done. I thought the trails, you know, pretty nice. It's beautifully laid out. The surrounding forest is gorgeous. It's just going to be such a beautiful amenity. That was kind of y'all's first ribbon cutting with mm -hmm. Rochelle and her crew and you and and I said, you know, first of many. <laughs> so just um, excited about that. I think folks are really, really um, happy to see that. So I appreciate that. Um, I have kind of heard a little bit about the on Facebook, you know, folks kind of, and I have noticed, I don't know if it's just, I, I noticed there's kind of been increased amounts of law enforcement calls to certain areas of the highway and stuff. I kind of look at the say the, you know, police reports and, you know, they always say an address. And so I kind of look on Google Maps and where that happened. They don't always tie up down, but it seems like there's also kind of questions about the, um, uh, what do you call them, waivers or homeless, uh, what are they called? Oh, vouchers. The, you're vouchers, talking the vouchers, vouchers yeah, at yeah. Best West. Right. The best and Western. so, yeah. and, you know, people are talking about that on Facebook and stuff. And I, you know, they're kind of talking about the city and the city, you know, go come to a city council meeting. And I kind of feel like, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't know hardly anything about it. And, you know, we're not the ones handing them out or, uh, you know, sponsoring and stuff. And so I just kind of feel like we should have a little bit better understanding of what's being done you know, what is the county doing? And so when people are asking about it, who, you know, who do they ask? Because I don't want them to ask me because I honestly don't know what's going on. So we somehow- We our own vouchers for Sam sitting on back. So I, I would respond with a couple of things like Kathleen, I think. One is, I, I think, I, I'd like our staff to look at, commu one, communicating that the city has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on. Yes. Um, you know, and the other is, is I think maybe we should, um, let's do it. Maybe have Tyler reach out to um, the Nick and what's Nick's cohort's name? Um, Fahid. Fahid. Oh, yeah. Fahid. And see if they would join us. Uh, well, well, they're they're kind of tasked with this. At, no, they're tasked with this at the county. Okay. And maybe have yes. these, yeah, have these guys come in and meet us at an official work session. Yeah. And and have a little okay. Q and A about what they're doing, so or, they can answer some of our questions. Or at the minimum, we haven't had a homeless task force meeting in a while, yeah. so yeah. if it's you know more expedient to do it that way. But let's work. But but, but let's work it out. Yeah. yeah. But let's maybe have them come to. Yeah. But but. In that, let's invite the other task force meetings to join us at that meeting. Maybe, you know, maybe open that up for public comment. Sure. Whatever, whether it's a work session or yeah, yeah. so that public can come and ask and say some words. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Okay. Yeah, just to get kind of some I like that. Clar clarification on what's going on. Cool. Good call. Rich. I like that. Just oh, I have one thing. Oh, the library's yeah. meeting is on Wednesday. The mayor has been invited to the meeting to um, talk a little bit about the library. Um, other library districts are um, work considering um, re revising our old, like 2008. Um, it's been revised since then, but the original was 2008, I think. Um, MOU that um, they want some sort of flexibility on using some of the district funds that they get for. Um, yeah capital investment type stuff, whether it's replacing HVAC or some of them are kind of going even further, like adding a wing or whatever. So um, the other districts are looking to revise their agreement that way. And um, our, our board is asking for that to be, um, to not happen. And for the, instead of allowing the cities to make the decision to actually allow the unincorporated citizens outside the cities to weigh in on that proposal because it does affect your total amount of dollars going to your library, you know, book purchasing and things like that that might affect them. So that's what they're presenting to the mayor and he's going to hear it out. Hear it out. Right. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Reg. Uh, I agree with uh, Lori. Kathleen, all that maybe maybe we do need to have a, a meeting, but I would really also like to hear, have them come to the full council and kind of share with us how how the um, how it's going for them throughout the county would be probably I think in, I guarantee it will be an interesting perspective. Nice. Um, 
One thing I heard, and I heard it pop up tonight, um, and it, it seems to be kind of a paramount issue, or it keeps getting brought up, is the, the road being plugged at 362nd at all, and I'll be there by the high school during the day. Um, I, I have two, two questions. One is that something, um, again, where are we, I guess, where are we at with the school board? and council joint session because that's a great topic i think to bring up um amongst all the other stuff that we've talked about and um the other piece is there something that we can do i do not i'm not in favor of going out and citing parents for trying to pick up their children and weaponizing for lack of better terms our our parents right to, to make the school board do something but is there something that we can do to compel the school board to have to fix that traffic issue? Much like we would with Dutch Brothers or 7-Eleven or any other business in town um, if they were backing up onto Highway 26. Yeah, so I'll say one thing and then I'll turn it over to uh, yeah. Chief Yamashita. Uh, but Chief and uh, Superintendent Bayer and I met three weeks ago? Two. Two weeks ago. I'm going to say two. Um, to talk about traffic issues starting in the high school and the middle school both. Um, we've got some drone footage to see what the actual mm -hmm. issue from an aerial perspective is. Um, we pulled, you know, some old planning documents to determine what were and were not allowable entry and exit points to make sure that we don't provide incorrect information as far as, oh, just do this instead. That will fix the problem if there's a, a current order that doesn't allow it. Um, but I, I'll let you shed some additional light into... You covered pretty much oh, everything I was going to do. I, you know, there's only really one true fix to that area and that's remove the medians that's what remove the medians mm -hmm. yes that's mm -hmm. the only true fix um so I, I disagree like well unless well, you somehow widen the road there you go. but we, currently the the problem as you well know is that folks are coming and staging to go pick up their kids I think that there are some things that we can do with the school district to reroute buses and to reroute the parents a little bit that will help that. But um, we've got some really good drone footage, like Tyler said, that will show you exactly where the problems lie and what they are. Um, Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll go around this. True statement, right? What time does the bell ring at the end of the day? For the high school, 2.15 or 2.30? Well, I, I, I want to say it's like 2.50. I don't know. It's like an odd number. If you're it's there, not like if you're, if you're in that, on that street, yep. 15 minutes before that bell, and there's an injury, a serious injury yep. to a kid yep. or anybody walking or car accident, you could not get an emergency vehicle up to them. That's correct. The, it is blocked. The only way yeah. the only way to do it would be to go into the oncoming lane of travel and hope that there isn't somebody coming no. towards us. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I'm just going to say what they're doing is illegal. Okay, they're not allowed to be parking. You know, both on Bluff and and all we need to be putting is up signs that say no stopping. Or parking. Uh, our parking, uh, and yeah. and and that's that's the law as it is now. And there are huge parking lots at the football field, over by the um, tennis courts. Um, you know, there's all sorts of places that people can go pick up their kids, and that you can stack up a bunch of cars in there to pick up your kids and and stage those cars that don't involve blocking up Bell Street. So that's, you know, the kids might have to walk a little further over to the tennis courts to get picked up, but oh, well, I just feel like that's, you know, taking out the medians and making, putting the, the solution on us when it's clear that that's not a legitimate use of our arterial roads like, is yeah, ridiculous. To tell them but don't, moms. You, you don't yeah. solve problems by guys, demanding guys, and running this, up rules up without involving yeah, the rest guys, of the world. This, this side of the yeah. ostrich is totally out of control. <laughs> like, totally out of control. Like, <laughs> we're, going, we're going around here, okay? <laughs> Lori. That is still me. Oh, I, and I, you I, have yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I, Can I just add one thing to, to Please. this? Um, you know, one of the other conversations, without getting too far into the specifics of, of the, the conversation we had, mm -hmm. was looking at better use of parking lots and such that are at yep. the school district site. So I think there's a long way to go between where we're at now and 
removing medians or where we're at now and citing people every day. I think there's some intermediate things that the school district can likely yeah. do that maybe we can be a good partner with them and in finding a solution for it. There is some PR and messaging. I, yeah, I think I think it's really important to provide an alternative or at least help problem solve it rather than just write tickets because all that's going to do is black eye and create chaos with mm -hmm. the parents. Yeah. They're not going to understand what to do in lieu of what they're doing now unless we have a plan for them and help re-educate them. It's yeah. been allowed to go on so long now that I, I, I'm i not going to write those people tickets. I mean, they've been allowed to do that for so long now. We need years. to provide an alternative. Not, not a well, yeah, well, we well, need Rich, to provide an alternative. Chief, thank you. Yeah, and and I, I actually I support that and, and agree with that. Uh, but here's here's what I do think. I do think this isn't you since COVID. One of the things that we're seeing is since COVID, I would venture to say, like every other place that I'm aware of, bus ridership has dropped for a mm -hmm. multiple mm -hmm. reasons, right? So that's part of the problem that we're seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it probably wasn't as big of an issue prior to 2020. But with that being said, many school districts. And it is a school district problem. And that's one of the problems with us going out and issuing tickets. I mm -hmm. think it's going to fall back on, on Sandy and ultimately our police department for uh, as a negative black eye when it's a school district problem. So with that being said, they've invested money to get traffic flow engineers out there and re-examining their parking lots and the flow of traffic and all of that out there. And I would really like some pressure because I don't think they're going to want to spend the money on their own. But I want to know if there's something that we can do to put that pressure so that it gets done. So that emergence to, to Chris's point tonight, so that, and and, there, and it, the multiple times we've heard it, that those emergency vehicles can get there when that kid gets hit with a baseball or, or falls down or, or whatever tragedy happens. Um, but I, I think, I honestly think that until they come to the table, which doesn't seem to wanna be so much, that it is a them problem. It's not an us problem. And I would like to see if there's some stuff that we can do to compel them to have to examine that. Because there is a lot of space out there that I think you could reroute some flows and, mm -hmm. and maybe even change. Yes, it's gonna take change and it's gonna take some some smarter people than, than me or probably any of us coming to the table to figure out, but the, it is doable. And, that's, that's, one of and the, that's the challenge that is frustrating is it's doable, but they don't seem to have that interest. And that's the piece that I, I think we need to help them create that interest. That's one of the reasons I wanted the drone footage was so we could really diagnose what the problem is and where it lies. So then we can get a better idea of how to fix it. And I felt like uh, Superintendent Bear was He's receptive very receptive to, to finding yeah. a solution. Oh, uh, you, you, got, you approached it with Dad. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think I've gotten huffy enough tonight. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Hey, I want to document the fact that this side of the council is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and we so yeah, it's, it's I want you to stay that. And and while it's not popular, I agree with Chief Yamashita that sorry guys, those medians at some point are gonna have to go away. I have it written down here. They are going report. to have so to go away. So, so um uh just a couple of things. Um Quickly, uh, I thought the trail opening was fantastic. Um, well attended yeah. by members of the community. Uh, mm -hmm. Several people, I'd say 25 people walked the trail, maybe more. I'm not a good counter of people when they're out <laughs> and about. You get them in a room and I can tell you. But um, uh, I thought the turnout was great. Um, and little kids all the way up to older adults uh, who needed uh, walking sticks. So uh, the trail's beautiful, it's in great shape. Um, it is going to probably open up a can of worms for some other things, though, because of its location. So, which will fall into <laughs> your ball wax, excellent, um, right? But uh, so anyway, so uh, great job by uh, by Rochelle and the parks and and the turnout was fantastic. So, and then just the other thing because I had never heard of this weed, um, and I believe it was Mr. Castle that mentioned it. Um, can we get on that? It looks like a pre-emergent herbicide, but it's like talking to, to yeah. all cattle all animals and their cows and all sorts of cattle uh animals been, along that because i brought that up to you brought it with me so. i um i got a better understanding of the issue but as far as a solution to the issue no there there hasn't been uh, progress made there but i yeah was once debriefed. again the assertion is that our contractor brought it 
to the area. And I just, I'd like to prove or disprove that. Well, that either way, like can we eradicate it? Can we yes. get out there and spray it? Because it's it's also like, it's years, huh? I'm concerned obviously about people's livestock, but bigger. even more so Definitely. it's um, it spreads. more, it's actually more likely to cause poison to children because it flowers and it's pretty and they touch it and it can be mm -hmm. deadly. So oh, nice. let's uh, let's get rid of it. Is it on our land? It's, yes. It's on, on the Bell Street. The right way. It, it okay. showed up after the construction. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, unless I I get your point, but I just want to let's fix it. And that's yeah, all I got. I, I so much just for clarifying. If our contractor did it, there may be some liability. That's fair. That that's mm -hmm. the concern. Yeah. There. I just want us to get rid of it you soon because it's that time of year where it's going to be growing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. Oh, yeah, Chris. I would just say thank you to the council for listening to my not so well put together argument um, for the funding district. I was in support of 10, but they didn't, they didn't go, it was, they got they got 20. Um, I, I understand the, the need for it and I just appreciate you all listening to me. I wasn't on my top game presenting it, but um, I don't like the 4-3 vote either like Don but you know what? Sometimes we all can't have the same opinion, and, and this year will be different, and that's why we have Seth. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I have not had any committee meetings in planning commission or economic development, so I have no update there. Um, I too would like to thank Jenny for her work in negotiating the settlement with the PA and the extension of our ERUs. And then I want to put a plug in for two upcoming events that I haven't heard nobody talk about yet. I'm going to get them both wrong. I know the dates. Um, there is Earth Day and there is Arbor Day. And they're both happening next week, I think. It's all cleanup. Yeah. That's right. And um, so put a plug out for those because we're doing something for them. So thank just you. to be clarified, Earth Day is April 26th. Thank you. And Salt Cleanup 20th. is this Saturday. And also, the uh, Quantits is doing the sportsman breakfast at the fire station. And that starts at seven. So you can go have breakfast and then come do the solve cleanup. And then uh, the next Saturday after that is the uh, Friday. What, what day? I can one up all of you. I got the 50 year anniversary of the senior center. Well, that's, that's right. That's on Ooh, Friday. Yeah. That's on Friday. Ah, that's a, but wait, there's more. Oh, there's <laughs> also oh, on the community oh, cleanup that? day um, yeah. with our garbage company Saturday, April 20th. 20th. Yeah. That's yeah. the same Absolutely. day as solve. Yeah. So it all falls on the same day. Yes, remind me. Is that Friday? The I want to say it's this Thursday, but hold on just yeah, one second. Maybe right. It's, it's, it's just 50 and older going. Is that what we're doing? Yeah. And then I would, <laughs> yeah. I would add just be on Medicare to one, go. one more appreciative thanks <laughs> yeah. uh, to the Tyler and the team. Uh, Tickle Creek, I, I just started recently walking a lot more, and Tickle Creek was my trail, and I can't do it anymore. So I'm up and down uh, DeBarco, and it is crowded. <laughs> I do it twice a day, 7.30 in the morning and at 3.30, and it's crowded out there. So uh, I, I heard the chainsaws buzzing today. I can't wait for the ticket trail to open back up. So thank you for this. Nice. All right, a couple things. One is, shoot, I already forgot it. April 18th. April 18th, two to four is the 50th anniversary uh, at the Senior Center. Uh, on the three, four boats, uh, I don't want them all the time, but uh, I don't mind three, four boats with this council. No. Uh, because we talk and, you know, we debate and we fully surround these topics and having been around, I guess, politics for a while, it, it honestly makes me like believe in what we do uh, because we're actually able to have grown up conversations in a room on a topic and not all be able to agree, but also then take on the next topic as a united unit and community members. So I just I appreciate all of you and your willingness and ability to do that. Um, uh, and just on the parks and trail uh, grand opening, I just want to uh, mention kind of compound. That's the word we're using tonight on what Lori used said, and that was just the different kinds of people at that grand uh, opening. Just all walks of life, different age groups, all using the trail for different reasons in different ways, and I just thought that was awesome. Uh, for a more controversial topic, I guess uh, these medians. Um, uh, don't get Tom Ellis, the mayor of Happy Valley, going on this. He'll go all night. Uh, he hates those meetings for all the emergency reasons that you're talking about, Chris. Um, I think we need to like have a conversation about medians for several reasons. And and Carl, I don't want to have that this debate tonight, right? Because I know we we have a lot of feelings on it. But let's have the debate 
um, the way our council does in the future. One is because of the maintenance. You know, uh, there's a lot of park type maintenance that happens when we put up these meetings. There's the emergency type problems that can can arise. My understanding for what Carl says out of frustration when I mentioned this is, is there's good, you know, environmental reasons for these. So we need to look at that. But let's look at it and talk about it. Let's make sure we're doing it the right way, the most economical way, the best maintenance way, right? Um, I'll buy into that. All, all, right. Right. all right, cool. I yeah. told Chris I've been saying it for years. Apparently yeah. I took him saying it for you guys to listen. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I've agreed. I've, 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 I've said, said it a couple on times, years too. Too. I, I say something? I've been I, saying I, it. Yeah. Just speak it over. And then let me speak it. Right. And then the last thing I wanted to say, and this is for like, this would be for new construction, new roads. Um, but um, Carl um, hosted a little meet and greet with Christine Drayton saying he's running for state rep. Um, one of the conversational topics out of there is, you know, every session, the legislature kind of picks that big item that they're taking on. This last time was housing, a little bit of infrastructure, which we got left out on. Mm -hmm. um, this next go around, it looks like it's going to be really transportation heavy. Um, and so while we'll want to maintain a strong water ask, it's probably going to make sense to have in our back pocket some sort of transportation ask. And uh, Lori, whether it's, you know, that further extension, like you mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, or I, I think some of us love the idea of industrial to Jarl Road, kind of what it can do for some of those properties. But it'll be something in a future meeting, maybe to have conversations about uh, maybe I didn't mention your favorite project. Sorry if I didn't. But uh, let's just have a conversation about what a potential uh, council, not main ask, because we know where, I mean, water wastewater is a major problem, but maybe kind of that. I think the bypass might be a little too big. I'm not looking for <laughs> <laughs> You know me, but I'm not, I'm not maybe, a little, maybe the on-ramp to it. Right? You saw the Oregonian said Tina's going to pull a lot of that wastewater money from rural communities. So that, that so that's my final update, actually. Yeah, so uh, governor's come out and mentioned um, potentially saying that she pulls certain projects if it didn't need to lead to immediate housing. Uh, we've talked to Nellie, our lobbyist, about that and reached out to some folks. We're going to keep an eye on it because uh, we feel we can show with our project, especially with some of the, these discussions we're having, that we, we could, could man, we, we, we could really with show with some fun. We're, we're right. shovel ready yeah. and yeah. direct. Well, especially, you know, so yes. well, anyways, I can't yeah. go into, but we, yeah. yeah. So I think there's some opportunities in that conversation for us. So we'll see where that goes. Cool. Uh, again, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. We'll close out. Thanks.